morning, um, half a day. The uh, 31st Guam Legislature is called back to order. We were in the Committee of the Whole. If uh, a member would like to make the motion for us to okay. um, temporarily suspend. Right. So, Mr. Speaker, I move that we uh, rise from the Committee of the Whole and temporarily suspend discussions until this afternoon, and we'll go back again, and that um, all the amendments that have been made shall remain intact. Is there an objection? All right. Uh, there being no objection, we will proceed to the regular uh, course of business and the next bill to be... Is it Bill 70? Bill 95. Bill 95, Senator Manas Silva Tyron. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we put this on the side while uh, some amendments were being looked into, but I don't, uh, I believe those amendments have been withdrawn or um, they're not going to push for an amendment. So I would, unless there's any other amendments being proposed, I would like to put, move it on to the third reading. Call. Is it, it's been already on third reading, right? Yeah. So I just want it was. There was, was a motion to put it on the third reading with discussion. For discussion today. All right. You're, you're recognized to speak on the bill. I already spoke on the bill. You already oh, spoke okay. on it? Yeah. Wait. Move it to the third. Please. All right. The legislature is back in session. Senator Duenas, you have an amendment? You're yes, recognized. I do. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to um, propose an amendment uh, to this critical legislation that I am in support of. Uh, the amendment comes on line 14 of page 1, 
and should read as such. That, um, after for the instruction of the Chamorro language, and inserted there is to include the origin of the language. And Mr. Speaker, very simply, uh, it, is, it is just to, uh, to once again reinforce, which I'm sure the Department of Education and the Board will do, um, establishing the curriculum, but, but just to reinforce the fact that uh, it is very important, I believe, um, as we're, we're going to expand the, the much needed teaching of our Chamorro language, but, but that uh, the, the students who are, who are studying the language uh, get, get the origins of the language or the origin of the language as well so that the curriculum is, is very strong and, and, and so that uh, perhaps even if they're going to use it as a college credit or, or on a college application, that it's, it's a recognized, uh, very strong curriculum-based teaching. So I just wanted to ensure that, uh, that that was in this legislation. And I spoke to the author, and I think she's okay with it. Any other senator wish to speak on the Duaneus Amendment? We're on 95, Senator Ben. We're on the substitute bill, is that correct, Senator yes. Tahiran? Yes. Um, Senator Duaneus, are you working with the substitute or the bill as originally introduced? Yes, the, the line number and the references don't match. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, I was not working, I was working with the, uh, the original version. All right, on the substitute version, what line would the amendment go on? Okay, um, comprehensive curriculum for instruction. Okay, so then it would go on line two, uh, Mr. Speaker, of page two. Uh, it is the same statement, and uh, starting with line one, the department shall develop a comprehensive curriculum plan for instruction of the Chamorro language to include No, the original one I had. No, the original amendment that I prepared. We're going to need to write it down because the clerks are going to need to have it also. Yeah, one minute recess, please, Mr. Speaker. No, it's just the original bill that I had, the original version that I wrote in amendment on. Yes, yes, I know, and I wrote it there. Okay. I'm ready, Mr. Speaker. Please. Okay. To, and so basically on line two, after Chamorro language, it would read to include the origin of the language. Is that clear to everybody? Does anybody wish to be heard or wish to speak on the amendment? Uh, Senator Adett. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to object to this or or I support the amendment. I, I really don't know when we say instruction of the Chamorro language, what all that encompasses, whether they, you know, whether it includes the the words that we learn and how that's constructed and its origin. So it just seems that that phrase instruction of the Chamorro language. I'm going to leave it to the experts. The language experts to to uh, dis to to decide really whether you know a teaching about the origins of the language and whatever other components that come with the learning of the Chamorro language. I think that probably uh, should be left with them. I um, so unless unless the you know unless the mover of the amendment uh, can can convince me that that's that. If we don't put that in, that then we're going to miss the boat on something. So if the mover of the amendment will yield. I certainly do yield, Mr. Speaker. Um, in discussions um, with, with uh, very learned and educated um, members of our body, um, you know, and who have uh, vast experience in the Department of Education, uh, have, have informed me 
that, that truly it is the, the job of curriculum and instruction to ensure that the, the, the origin of language and, 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 and the um, instruction of, of, of language is, is, is a curriculum-based um, you know, endeavor. Uh, this is just reinforces uh, the fact that, that and, and it actually was discussed that with, in particular as the Chamorro-based teaching in our schools is actually still an evolution. Uh, there are some debates whether uh, immersion is the best um, process, whether a written, oral, um, the, the, the whole just process of, of, of our renaissance of our language is something that is actually still being developed. So this is simply just another reinforcer that when Department of Education receives uh, this um, bill or this law, uh, should it pass, that, that it's very clear that it really should be a strong curriculum-based teaching and it really uh, should be the origin of language so that, so that uh, it really leads up to the base of language and the teaching is, is very strong as such. So that's just the simple purpose of the amendment, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Senator Duenas. Senator Ada, is that sufficient to allay your concerns? I'm, I'm, uh, no, it isn't. And I, I, for me, uh, just the phrase uh, that we're mandating the instruction of the Chamorro language. And like I said, I'm going to leave it to the, uh, to the, um, to the language experts to, to uh, decide. So I'm going to go ahead and object to the, uh, because I, I don't know what else I don't know what it is that we're telling the linguists to, do, you know, by adding that, getting starting to get really specific now. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and object to it. Anybody else wish to be heard on on this? With the objection, we'll take a vote on the Duenas Amendment. All those in favor of the Duenas Amendment, please indicate by raising your hand. Those in favor of the Duenas Amendment, indicate by raising your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I only show seven, it fails. Anybody else wish to speak on the bill? Senator Ben. See this, Marcy, uh, Mr. Speaker. Speakers, no quite just fun and a little yos mo. Don't peg a got to get some more time. The Mungana un utu did and Matui can see minutus a sinata stira. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of this piece of legislation and I certainly want to give my appreciation to the author of the legislation and members of this body for deciding to consider this piece of legislation. Tadzagi na gagonyasti ima pupopuni senyor na parata na siguru na ningayan no man malefa tana kella la ta lumos sa timamata itabia para guau ni guai sampiling ya gizista bunti tsatsa flik esti lingua hita dan ikutrota guini gita nota sa Esta no tayita man mayot, esta gini paogu gi tanota. Esta anun tufung toru ni tauto dan ni klasi ni manggagi gini afasya na rasa ni manggagi gini ti esta 50% itu itamoru. Lo fit me dan siguru haji gaita no esti. Haji umat sa esti na tanu gini nilala dan ni kutura. How do you go mona this to turn the tempo? Animan ma matu bisita ta guini sa siya man man bisita ti siya do mis kubriyet na ita man no man malingu da ti tatungu mano ni gaiget siya man malingu da ti matungu man mano ni man gaigi siya ani man gaigi kita si da manisisita i gunahan ni tanu. Sa tajasta na niya, tajasta no provision niya, gi batkun niya. Jagi karera niya, mancinenik mogi ni manglu za ni kurenti. Da ejuna manasudait, 
ni esti tauto san lagu sia zaman masoda gu ini ti tauto nia ti matungu haji hit lo hita ta tungwa haji hit ja hafate manu na ta tungu haji hit dan manginin manu hit gini ni lingua hita dan ni kutrota gini historia sia ni manai nana manai nata masangonit hafa sia man malofan i tempo antigo dan tempo antis Enigi mas fit me parogineti esti iri tau tau ni atungo hoji gigi antinya hoji gigi hinasonya hoji gigi sinintenya jatai manu sinyon no ilokui yo tru tai jau comprendi hoji ho angin ti lingui homo dan ikutromo Gua hau tunga sempre mega gi ujung lengalane ta lustisia. Saporo magasta isalapi. Daparo makesat basta iji taibalina lingwahi. Mono gini sinya macu tsuan samoro sinya nu. A comprendi pat mos maulik fimnu samoro mono gini sinya macu tsu taimanu a poksai familionya. Ani sisita fimnu english jigi maulik pat Pun mas, fano gilo kifinu Japanis. Sa enigi ni sinya, enigi siya ni bagi kus i komisyon ti siya ni salapi ni bumi biragui. Da sinyong gana para un support ti famagon i famagon mo dyan i familyam mo. Ti man makomprendis ti siya. Guaha siya ang giyudong ni Timanhita na rasa lo makomprendi sa makomprendi rasa niya lo kwi. Makomprendi na gwa tanu niya masya manggaigi siya guini pogo. Lo ang ginmaatan tati istora niya masinya mapunta untano guini giterumundo na edzigi tanu i rasahu tanu i familyaku kaigi gi gwa tu Masya kaya gitu, gue ini lo jigi gua tu. Pus debi lo kue nai hita di tafan siguru nai nama masya. Manggaiget Texas, pan manggaiget DC, pan manggaiget Filipina, pan manggaiget Eropa na bonda. Debi di sini ta punta tati za jigi jigi tanu manai nahu, tanu gue lo ku gue lah, tanu manantigo gue na tau tau gue sini rasa aku jigi. Da tamanu no tungu sa maestro Jesus. Tamanu na maestro Jesus, maestro Jesus gilingguayo, gilingguay ni Samoro. Unkan ta tungu na Ta fanon na gusti famaguo ni fino Samoro gi eskuela. Jaungan megay. Megay na biay na ni sita ta defendi hit pudi ta tsotso gusti gi tano ta. Da guana na bubu zu, guana na kati zu, sa nisisita beo defendi gui niya. Gitano i tamoru pa beo defendi hafa na usupopoti tamoru. Hafa na leku isti gubi nota debi di chogui lo kwe no. Sa hafa na pa beo defendi no. Siya mon, ufangai grasya. Jauh maluk si Jus masih nimbaba hitan umi tu zaman gaigit gue ni zaman hitap aku. Mainlah tanah si guru na lot lot mas. Lu God ki peroma funas sa di melalagonia peroma cowok gue gini kita nota. Hafal ni nata gue nosti. Tiki ni mafatuzu bini buhu na bana. Ti tristi stab bini bu. Idotas ti, hunggan, hunggan tababa ko rason ta tababa i tanota. Lo dale jay man taigrasyas ti siya, dale jay taza haga gi matania jay ti man mamot lo ni parofan matugini, pas po matuli 
Feradi guinahani tanu, pomatsuli guinahani antita. Partafan ma omu ni lingua hita sa, parofa ino non gasta sa lapi publiku para ino. Lati no na inasu, guinigi za guam, guahon. Lati no na inasu giza limon, lati no na inasu giza apon, pad Filipinas. Sa angin matu guina tonu, unli sempre dan experiencia. Nan malaki sekolah, man ma fanon na guifa maguni lingua hinia. Sa hafa, sa matungo. Na edzigi po fansinat ba para mo na guinigitano? Iparaguaha identifikun niya, itautaw niya. Todig tempo ifamagun niya. Umatungo ginin manu siya. Hafa ikuturan niya. Hafa siya gaibali ginilala niya ang ginmaatan kontra itano. Istigi takeke sad ba? Estigi takeke na siguro na pati istigi nila lo, tapat tigi sa tayakasyon na sistema. Sa tayguen na wa istigi o trilo gan. Sa hofa na para pogo para tisinyahid guin ni dapat para ta defendi ta ta totso gusti. Ang ginuntungo Otro na lingwai, masya tifinut sa moro, masya hafa na lingwai. Binababay na son mo, binababay kurason mo, jasi niya mangumprendyo, siya ni otro na kutura. Jani ngayan no babay no, an matu eno na tiningo, matu eno na gunayza, matu eno na sinenti, giyon tauto, giyon patgon, an dumangkulo. Tiyo tinanda, ya putunidad siya, na hinat sa mga si Apatunidad para edo na tao to, ang gingay ginaw gi sentimento niya. Ang gingay ginaw gi kurason niya. Ang ginsi niya, aata ni bisinu niya da agkumprendi na ti pareo siya, lo pareo siya tao to, da umarispita. Todo yung gingay gi, gi esti anong komprendi, anong komprendi, anong komprendi may sao, anong komprendi lingwahi mo, anong komprendi kutura mo. Ini kita no muna gagwa, ini kita no imenaulik. Tipe sinya taoluk half a day esti, tipe nestia. Ipe sinya tak kumbe half a sin entini half a day. Datana siguru na gai gia no gikurason ta. Jigi na tanu isti, jigi isti na usah popote. Tiput para umatungu, fan mangkuntai fan maguun pat, hafa na Simona isti, hafa na Dia isti, hafa na Mes. Ti enau ha? Sa sinya enau fan awi loru. Ti mapu de no? Ang sige ang fanagwi ang kwento si Loro doon repitia, repitia lo kwin na lunis matis met kilis webis. Pa hafa hafa. Lo ti enno ni. Ti enno susastan niya si. Ti enno ginagagaw ni si. Ti enno takiketsugwi puro isti tasugwi si. Para tana mas fanta. Diyan pa na tana pati isti lingwahita gi. Pamaguanta. Diyan suka Hot tu kati cemuru na pot gunza aku prendis ti mas loku, you know, anu nasi mesti speak, me gay pagu pagu pot pagu nesti na email, me gay boy ni man ma man manoid an hafa pagu nu mali, you know, gini gini internet, guasya atu ngota sistemman gay gay loku gini gini lah aku na Ritno fila, man, todo man matugigit tati na imos minaguf na sinenti, mos minaguf na sakan siya, ginilala niya, ani mahasu itagwam, da mahasu siya'y amiguta, itamoro, 
mahungu ke lingwahi ediki mas muna mamagim kurasunya sa hafa sa enigi nei sustansyanya sti tanota Guinigi alatsa mana amiza ni class of 65 ni tauto uh, father doenya sama doctor ti 65 or class of 74 no ma doctor zaman hami todo gi dunia reunion zaguanu megaisha men sahi man matu gi ni dunia classmate gi ni san lagu zan guaha matu magi abira gi magi zan ni kumik kuntu sam dan si mr brown lo apaka ja astura rajizu ina sonya jan hafana mattu ge tatti jigi shentu anyus tato gusti pago shentu anyus mona ja ta hasu istina dia ifa magonta masu tigi sempiling ya lani no sa ti masutta manatsu i Manya nata, zaman na siguro na sinya lokuit tahasui tempun antes, jaga gaya apa aku? Jigi, isti, sustansanya, isti gigi na gagaunya. Eno wa, para biasangan apa aku nau gan nu, Mr Speaker, jam. Sturajo, ani ututun matutu lokui gini gi kumpanya nai jat autosan lagu sia, jam kadaman matu sia autosan lagu magi man magas sia, bisa di hitam mas magas, periodistik kumpanya san hijung nai, pus kadaman matu no magi pes man magu putih nai, pues lengnya Guana gua mana MC gigi pun nih pagu, pos anu tutun komen tu sepagu nih, fumin uca moru tu pagu pes pemarau tu translator, pes duruman tanu dengan festik, pes duruman mabirai ilunia zaman kuin tutus siay siay uca moru dengan apa yang sudah apa yang lagi seben apa yang lagi seben Jadi aku komprendi nai, komprendi, dah sempil mas, um komprendi. Ti ilingguaya, nagaio gue ni respeta dah lay jati sinya, dah megai megai, mana hita gue ni ni tato san hidung zaman masuk puputit, pus ti tani sisita nata utu desti sa ti zaman masuk puputit. Nafan siguro. Si Dus Mawase, Mr. Speaker. Sayon Mawase, Senator Ben. O Tris na doon malay ko mahungok gi isi na legislation. Anybody else wish to be heard on this bill, on the motion? Senator Manas, do you wish to move the close? Oh, yeah. Uh, my name is Mr. Speaker, I have a comment on the bill. 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 Ima na gahit, enwa na sinya na tara tagoti sti lingwahita da mas para tatungo zangin sigya ta praktika. Suka tatungo na aapling lo zangin entre mas ta usa leko na menos inapling. No, magahit na Tunga ay tungo na mamaisen na paraon kalan puno na yun ni Lilosmo sa nu sa nu pero lagmos todo y sinintenya puri lingwahi lo utunga lo kaya migu na guida na klasis malu y taihinikuk 
Parehu na na the level of proficiency ni ezi senador gini ni the barigada ni magahit nu ana golf sinya lo masiksa um palabraha kada dia tata taspia tata usa dan nu tasiga umu tasiga nu promaktika pues nu the pues istine na lai para para ma proponi ni para mas e e pena nagui gi gi escuela se para famaguon pues dangen para ta dirigi na para matsogis ti gi escuela lekuna importante lo ke na ta tutuhun gi zahita sa ta zagi promaktika ta zagi mo studia mas gi fisinahu guahagi dos na na dictionary na dictionaryo uusa uno gine na si Dr. Benedita Dunka sa ibalina zo na dictionaryo no zangin tuntugo afay palabra gi fino samoro guaha luke gi no fino english pues zo non spia sa fino no hafa na fino samoro pues gua luke otro na dictionaryo ni kalan mas no tadung ni finatinas gine na Dr. Catherine Ogun pues no magahit na ti kada dia na bababay zo na leblu lo um ti una utsagi na munga mana falofa ni simona be be spiai i tempo ni para be baba ra masksha pa bi tungo hafa sha no na palabra gi no pues ta ta usa lo eno na sina magahit still language hita no na para la la sa para ta susteni zangin Siga ta praktika dididi adumididi adumididi sa utunga na ezi e amiguhu ginin barigada no parewa zangwa luke istiki ti utungo fumineo english istiki ani seti onyus do lo no um minagahin na i didi tempo gi kalamana para i i lingwahin samoro gi skuela sa fino english sa mga Pain English ha no ta praktitika sa kalan malingo gi didide lo new nayan no falingo i lingwahe sa gaigya eno magai ni maaluk first language pues no eno na zangin siga ma praktika teniki matto tatti talo pues no magai na be 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 support this din a lai sa malik sti senator tayro ni bidamo ah stad dos sti na lai um proponi pagu na Session is still an easy option. Put per own spia in this daddy tauto malesu shall put a z bridge give up at me. Kalan no ma disattendia lo malik bidamos and no pues bueno than be saluda how no senator tyron ni still a mobile senator tyron. Mr. Speaker, I invite the two previous speakers to uh, to be co-sponsors on this bill, if they accept. There being no objection. Senator Ben is a second co-sponsor. Hearing no objection, thank so you. ordered. Well, thank you, and I wish I could speak as eloquently as both uh, speakers uh, before me, but unfortunately I come from an era that didn't have the Chamorro language taught in the school system, and so I feel like I missed out on, on such a valuable lesson and we didn't speak it at home, and, and that too I regret, and I'm embarrassed to be at this age in this body and not be able to speak the language of this land. And that's why I put forward this bill, because I want to preserve what we have and what is so much a part of our Chamorro culture on Guam. And you know, I, I do want to commend the Department of Education because they've come a long way in pushing the Chamorro language and implementing it in our schools. And the children have such a desire to learn the language, and that just moves me. And I see it. My own kids are coming home and speaking the language, and they're just enjoying 
having that culture and bringing it to home and teaching it to mom. And so I really appreciate what the Department of Education has done. But I do see that they could do more, and I believe that they agree that they also could do more and they want to do more. And in, our pub in the public hearing, they testified that they are willing if we give them the resources, and I believe that Speaker Wampat's bill gives them the resources to meet their needs so that they can feel, fulfill this requirement. Our children really have an opportunity to learn our language and our culture, so I really want to help them along. Uh, for too long, I believe that this language and our culture has been suppressed and oppressed, and from a time when we were told not to speak the language, I think what, that this is our time to let this be the renaissance of our culture. Let this be our legacy. And if we truly believe that Chamorro is a valuable part of our island and our culture, then let's prove it. And I ask my colleagues to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator um, Tyron. On the motion to move the bill to voting file, hearing no objection. The next bill on the agenda is Bill 111. Senator Duenas. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. I rise to uh, request that Bill 111 be re moved to the third reading file, and I'd like to discuss it. Please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The first thing I would like to do is um, to add two co-sponsors to this bill, Mr. Speaker. The first being uh, Senator Tina Munya Barnes, and the second being um, Senator Sam Mabini. Hearing no objection. Mr. Speaker, after hearing the eloquent speech of my good colleague on, this, on the bill for Chamorro language, I'm hoping that the language teaching of Chamorro now becomes the new invasive species on Guam. But Bill 111, Mr. Speaker, and I want to start by thanking a number of my colleagues to include my good co-sponsor, Senator Eileen Yamashita, my good, the good oversight chair, Senator Guthers of Customs, the good oversight chair uh, of Natural Resources, Senator Respicio. And I, and I say that because it really, if, 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 if I could get close to experiencing excruciating um, experience of childbirth, this bill for me at least, and the legislature has been an experience in that. But it was for the hard work, Mr. Speaker, that this substitute bill has hit the floor in its, hopefully, its best possible form. And of course, I'm welcome to additional amendments today as if, if those of this body see fit. But Mr. Speaker, this, this bill is, is extremely important for the future of Guam. This bill does three things fundamentally to begin with, Mr. Speaker, and that is to address the issue of invasive species when it comes to our pristine waters around our island, Mr. Speaker, and, to, and by establishing, well, first and foremost, it establishes the Invasive Species Council, which, as I've spoken to many times on this floor, Mr. Speaker, that the best intentions of executive orders are only as good as the next chief executive that comes into office and chooses to, to enforce that executive order. So this actually was born out of an executive order, Mr. Speaker, to put into law this council, this very important council, to address the issues of invasive species. And so moving forward, this council, Mr. Speaker, will we'll address as many one of the, the, the major issues is to address the non-addressed at this time uh, monitoring and, and possible or, or eventual eradication of any invasive species that we will find or may find uh, in, in, in our body of water that surrounds our island, Mr. Speaker. The, there's really not an order of importance with regard to the other things that this bill will do immediately, Mr. Speaker. The second will, will be to, to really stand up uh, monitoring and eradication of the inland of the border, Mr. Speaker. As we know right now, and you, you yourself, Mr. Speaker, and members of this body have had to transfer up to, I believe, $2 million over, this, over several years just for the rhino beetle. 
And what comes to mind immediately beyond that is a CICAD scale, Mr. Speaker. I was hiking to the Pogget Caves with other members of this body several months ago. And it was pointed out to me by Mr. Kanata that almost all of the fatting that surrounds that area inside of Pogget, Mr. Speaker, are decimated. Almost all of them are dead because of the CICAD scale. And we do not have to look very far, Mr. Speaker, to see the bountiful canopies around our island that are covering our trees and, and causing major erosion problems because the natural growth underneath those canopies is not occurring because these trees are now covered with this vine that did not exist when I was a little boy on Guam, Mr. Speaker. And so that's just the name of few of those invasive species that require and need this inland capability of monitoring and eradication. Mr. Speaker, the other issue that will be addressed that is very important in order to do that work is to stand up immediately inside of the border a rapid response team to be well equipped that we realize, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to stop every invasive species at the border. We wish that would be true. But we have to work closely, and, that, and this is in this legislation, Mr. Speaker, from the border out, coming to the border with our customs officials, and then inland making sure that our science team, our agriculture folks, the University of Guam, which is in this bill, Mr. Speaker, have the resources and the capability to immediately, first of all, try to stop it at the border. But if we don't stop it there, Mr. Speaker, then we have to do the arduous and difficult work of eradicating it once it's made it past our border. Mr. Speaker, as I said, it is not in the order of importance when we discuss who is affected by invasive species. So I go now to our farmers, Mr. Speaker, who are crying out and who strongly support this bill, understanding that we have not done enough. We have to do more when it comes to not only stopping invasive species, but making sure that we take care of them as well, Mr. Speaker, when these invasive species are decimating their crops. They toil in the sun all day. They work hard. They propagate their farms. Their margins are not huge. And sometimes their labor is in vain as they watch their crops dwindle away because of a species that they don't understand and they were not familiar with and that their losses are something that sometimes aren't even recouped. So Mr. Speaker, it's for these reasons and many more really that I ask my colleagues to please support this very vital piece of legislation and Mr. Speaker, just in closing, we attached an MOU to this piece of legislation and also stood up a very strong, as I like to say, the good president of, of the University of Guam likes to say, the honest broker. The honest broker from the University of Guam in terms of an individual that's, that, that will be impartial in this process to work with the council and to stand up that one division to ensure that everybody plays well together, that we give all of the frontline individuals, first responders, and, and those who will monitor our borders, the, the resources that they need, Mr. Speaker, as this is a bill that will open up doors for millions of federal dollars to come in to our island to assist with our efforts. That MOU is very critical, Mr. Speaker. It's attached to this piece of legislation and it lays out the roadmap of how those who are responsible for this monitoring and eradication, their clear responsibilities and that all are given the proper resources that they need to do their job, Mr. Speaker. So once again, I ask the members of this body, and I thank the 11 members who voted to do pass 
on this piece of legislation with the committee report coming out. I pray that their votes maintain and stay the same, and I look forward to the discussion and debate on this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss it, Mr. Speaker. I retire at this time. Thank you very much, Senator Duenas. Any other senator wish to be heard on Bill 111? I, I see the hand of Senator Ben and then Senator Rory, then Senator Guthards. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm a little, um, I understand what the intent is, but you know, we're, having, we're setting up uh, inspection fees and setting, uh, setting a fee for this. We're uh, doing a fund. I, I just, I don't understand, uh, I guess, all of that without any um, uh, input, I guess, from the, from the community that, you know, <clears throat> I just can't, I think we need like a committee of a whole on this one too, in terms of exactly what it's going to do. You know, we, I tell you, as, as the good retiring speaker said, you know, we've thrown money at, at this stuff and I, I'm not sure what's going to be different now. I mean, we haven't been able to combat the Cadena de Amor, the the rhino beetle and so forth. So what's going to be different? You know, I'm just, I'm un uncertain just reading at this that setting up a council and putting a fee in place is going to, to kind of do more than what we've been doing. And uh, I just, I just have a, a problem, Mr. Speaker, with the, the, the language here that sets up these fees without if we're setting up fees, I, I, I don't know that we should be doing it this, in this fashion. And so for that reason, I'm a little leery of, of proceeding uh, with supporting this bill, uh, given those, and, uh, that, uh, those inclusions uh, in, in here. Um, and I guess I'll just continue to listen and get some additional explanation because um, I, I just don't see the... I can't see the picture yet, so I just want to say, uh, to articulate that, I'll read the committee report and, and see if I can find something. Thank you very much, Senator Ben. Um, Mr. Majority Leader, you're up next. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in uh, support of Bill 111, uh, and I want to say that uh, we all uh, recognize that uh, Bill 111 is a long time coming. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, previous administration uh, tried to do something like this by way of a memorandum of understanding that was initiated by the United States USDA, uh, and um, in one uh, term, um, a uh, natural resource committee headed by Senator Spadan was also uh, instrumental, Mr. Speaker, in trying to get this uh, group together. But what we've seen over the years is uh, it's been a, a unwillingness to do so, not because it's not the right thing to do. We recognize it's the right thing to do, but an unwillingness to do so because of motivations and competition. Competition for, for the amount of fees that the Customs and Quarantine is trying to establish uh, and so in this current legislature and through this current process, uh, through the combined leadership of um, Senator Guthards, who has oversight over customs, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, myself and even the administration uh, recognizes that um, there's no uh, need to have competing interests and there's no need to set up walls with respect to the responsibilities, whether it's um, inland or outland, uh, and to recognize that um, customs and quarantine uh, and the Department of Agriculture have to work hand in hand to make something like this viable. Uh, as you know, um, in the 2003, when the legislature moved to put um, plant protection and quarantine under the customs and quarantine, um, I would say over and over, Mr. Speaker, that that uh, for my part, uh, I don't think uh, we I should have decided in that particular um, uh, manner to move in that direction and. And it was done, Mr. Speaker, because uh, following 9-11, everything uh, with respect to border control was 
customs and quarantine to take care of uh, everything, uh, including uh, prevention of uh, guns from coming into the borders, uh, as well as um, drug interdiction efforts. Uh, and now they included uh, invasive species. Customs and Quarantine uh, was able to get about $2 million a year uh, to fund the PPQ division, uh, to stand up that division. Uh, but because Customs had decreased uh, revenues, because we know their budget comes from the per passenger plane fee, uh, and because of the economic situation we've been in over the years, uh, the number of uh, tourists less coming to Guam, that fee has declined. And so as a result, their budget declined. And so through no fault of their own, Mr. Speaker, they've used that $2 million uh, to supplant their operations. Uh, and the reality is their focus really is customs mission, and the PPQ division was kind of diluted. Uh, and so the science behind protecting our borders and preventing uh, invasive species from entering our island uh, has been diluted, and we're paying the price right now. You yourself, uh, Mr. Speaker, through the combined uh, cooperation of our appropriations chairman had had to find uh, in excess of eight hundred thousand dollars to combat the rhino beetle uh, because we know what that devastating uh, effect that uh, will have and has had on our tourism industry if the rhino beetle continues to eat at our, our palm trees and coconut uh, trees then and that's what the tourists uh, come here to see uh, that kind of uh, natural beauty here on Guam and so what 111 does it it takes all that effort over the last that's been uh, happening over the last um, eight or nine years and puts this into a uh, statute. Uh, and I want to recognize um, the sponsor of this legislation, Senator Duenas, uh, for having the, the ability and the foresight uh, to do something like this. We've also been able to determine that the current fee schedule that Customs is undertaking uh, in no way ever purported to fund a agricultural quarantine inspection uh, division within their uh, department. So after that matter was um, ascertained, uh, we also want to make sure that there are no uh, duplication of uh, efforts with respect to how we're going to combat uh, these invasive species. So having um, said all of this, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's really important that we uh, focus our attention and energy on uh, moving Bill 111 forward uh, to recognize the consequences of not uh, entertaining a program that would uh, combat the invasive uh, species by having this biosecurities task force, but also recognizing uh, if we have the challenges that we have today, how much more would the uh, pending uh, military buildup and the population spike that we're expecting over the next um, several years. And so, you know, this is a very um, lengthy bill. Um, granted, there is a, um, a fee attached to this and the uh, for or how this is to be uh, funded and um, by way of, uh, of being uh, implemented. And, and I want to say that um, agriculture and customs, I'm confident, uh, are in agreement uh, with this version. And I'm fully uh, confident uh, to say that uh, we are prepared uh, to move forward um, in this kind of fashion. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader, Senator Guthrie, then Senator Mabini. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, <clears throat> this is a very, very important bill, and I want to commend uh, Senator Duenas and Senator Yamashita for working so hard on it and for their cooperative spirit in working with the uh, committees that basically have oversight of uh, customs and also agriculture. All of us uh, from Guam who've grown up here have seen some changes in our environment over the years some of which is quite disturbing with the infiltration into our island of various uh, uh, non-indigenous uh, species of uh, bugs that have impacted our greenery. And of course everyone's familiar with the rhino beetle, but there are other invasive species that have made their way to Guam. And uh, some of them have been interdicted at the ports uh, and we want to commend, of course, our customs officers for being vigilant. As you know, over the last year or so, we've had a couple instances of uh, contaminated sand coming into Guam for construction purposes that was rightfully rejected uh, by the Department of Customs and Quarantine after assistance from agriculture. Some scientific uh, tests were done on the sand which showed that it was highly contaminated and not in the best interest of the people of Guam to allow it to be unloaded from the vessel 
so it was sent away. And then uh, customs also interdicted uh, uh, spiders, <laughs> uh, dangerous spiders uh, that were really found throughout a shipment coming in from another country in Asia. And these spiders uh, are, are the kind of spiders that if they bite you, there are serious consequences. And they intervened there and uh, we were able to uh, do it early enough so it did not become a serious problem. Although some of the spiders actually, I understand, made it to a retail establishment, was found later and uh, this was quite disturbing. So there's no question that we need a formal mechanism to ensure that uh, we are able to respond quickly and decisively uh, using science as the basis of, uh, uh, of making decisions on how to handle these kinds of, of matters. And that's what the intent of this bill is, to finally put in place a formal uh, council that will uh, basically oversee uh, this kind of activity representative of the appropriate agencies of this government as well as our uh, institution of higher learning, the university, which does the research and has the scientists there to work with agriculture and other entities and to really put a strong front forward. Uh, as you know, we are anticipating a dramatic increase in cargo coming into Guam over the next few years primarily because of the buildup, but also because of increased economic activities on the island that will come with the buildup, uh, new construction projects uh, and land uh, activities will require the importation of certain uh, goods, materials, and chemicals into Guam. And with that are always the risk of uh, invasive species hopping onto these transshipments into the island. And we have to have a very uh, vigilant and aggressive mechanism to uh, deal with these potential threats. Now all of us recognize Customs' role. Customs is a law enforcement agency and its role is at the border to intercept things at the border. But when things escape the borders, whether through the port or through the airport, and they make their way onto land, we also need another mechanism to intervene. So this council and the participating agencies uh, that will be involved in the council will uh, help uh, with the goal of ensuring that nothing escapes into Guam that cannot be dealt with effectively and immediately. Now the uh, bill I think was, uh, the substitute bill I think represents all the different perspectives that came into play. And we had quite a few meetings with respect to this uh, particular proposed bill uh, and the resulting substitute. Uh, a number of meetings with uh, key stakeholder groups, uh, agencies involved, and also uh, members of the uh, representatives of the uh, committees participated and the sponsors. And uh, we uh, came up, I think, with a good, good bill. So I'm really happy to support this bill. And of course, I'd like to ask the sponsors to include me as a co-sponsor, because I think it's important to show that uh, we are unified, uh, particularly at the committee chair level, uh, for this. By the way, I also look at this as a homeland security issue. Anything that is prejudicial to the well-being of our island and our people, to me, is a homeland security issue. Whether they're bugs, tarantulas, uh, uh, dirty sand, uh, rhino beetles or anything else affects our homeland. So I would like to stand as chair of the uh, Military Buildup and Homeland Committee in support of this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Senator Guthard. Senator Mabini, then Senator Palacios. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of Bill 111. Uh, you know, I'm currently working or had just recently submitted bill, which is Bill 181, which um, is somehow related to this because of the involvement of the Customs and Quarantine Division, which I've learned and I'm sure that my colleagues have also learned are 
in serious need of support um, to tackle on the multiple tasks that they have as, uh, as far as their enforcement uh, responsibilities. Uh, one of the things that also caught my attention when we had done a tour recently up at Anderson Air Force Base was um, the lack, if I'm not mistaken, the lack of uh, access that some of our biologists could have uh, done for, for, the, uh, for the facility or for the, um, the habitat, habitat up north. And that's a concern of mine. I live in Maina, and I have all those white buckets that we see usually around throughout the island regarding the rhino beetle. And um, we have beautiful palm trees around my area, and we're already seeing some, um, some trees that are dying off there. Now, beyond the rhino beetle, there are other issues like what um, my, our, the previous speaker had mentioned, um, other invasive species that we need to be concerned of. The cost that the, that the island will incur if we don't do this will be more than what we anticipate today. This bill um, introduces, yes, some fees, but I think these are fees that are needed, uh, fees that are, requ that, that, um, are required, and I, I believe as well, by establishing this, by, by passing this bill, we also help increase the opportunity of, of Guam, for Guam, to receive the kind of grants that other states, that other um, uh, places receive to support the kind of security that we, you know, that they need and that we need uh, to protect our habitat. So again, I, I commend the author of the bill and also the co-sponsors, and I encourage everybody to support Bill 111. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Palacio, she recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the bill, uh, the intent of the bill. I have a point of inquiry that I would like to ask the author. Actually, on page, page six, uh, it has to do with the establishment of the, uh, the fee. There's an item on line 22, for example, air freight. Uh, it includes air freight. Uh, how about mail order of uh, something bulky and not just plant material and those things? I mean, is that subject also to the $1 fee? Uh, because it, here is $1 per ton or fraction there also. I would, I would think that the minimum is $1, whatever is the weight. Does that apply? Then? Does this apply to the things that come in through the post office other than the orchid and those things that are air flown? Mr. Yield. Speaker, Senator, I'm please. happy to yield, Mr. I mean, Speaker. No, it does not. As a no. matter of fact, the establishment of the, all of those areas, this is included so that we do not delete any okay. ongoing uh, that's already being handled okay. by AQI and Customs. The fee in B that's established is on ton, uh, cargoes that are coming, containerized cargo coming into the port. Okay. And so it does not affect uh, any, any mail. Uh, and, and AQI actually, as it stood up right now, is still maintained by customs, okay. and they do those inspections at the airport. They already have that fee schedule. This is only on containerized cargo. Okay. Another question, uh, Mr. Speaker, is it says here that beginning on line 23, uh, you know, the, the, where it says the fee shall be paid by the person responsible for paying the freight. In other words, the shipper uh, or the consignment to the transportation company, and then the transportation company would forward it to, the, to the agriculture. But then it says here that the, provided that the transportation company shall not be liable for any fee that is not paid by the person, so there would be the occasion then when the person responsible for paying the freight probably would not probably pay such a freight over to the uh, transportation company. And so there would be then a weakness here in, the, in, in not all the time that, that this fee would be collected. So how can, you know, how can this be made fair then and make sure that it applies to, to all cargo, to all freight. Uh, we have to pin this down as to how we can ensure, and that's, that's what I see. To yield, uh, Senator uh, Duenas, please. Yes, um, I yield to that, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is, this is um, a, at the border, so it would be no different than the current way that customs fees are being imposed. I couldn't imagine fee being, or cargo being released without that fee being paid. This, I believe this was written in here just to ensure that it's clear who pays uh, the fee. But as, aside from that, I don't believe cargo at, can be released um, prior to fees being paid um, at, at the point of entry. 
Thank you, Senator Duane. Uh, Senator Palacios, you have further questions? Uh, actually, that's not complete. That does not satisfy completely. Oh, that's not satisfactory. Um, you may have In a follow-up question if you wish. I, I understand that, that maybe uh, the releasing authority then would say, well, we have to pay the fee. But what authority does that person has to say that you, you, didn't, you didn't pay to the transportation company, then we'll collect it from you? Because here the, the, the sentence here just say that provided that the transportation company shall not be liable for any fee that is not paid by the person for paying the freight charges to the... So what was, what was the alternate method of payment then? If it's not to the transportation company, then we have to either then collect it by a prior to release of the cargo. That kind of language then would, would seal that, in my opinion, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, otherwise, if there's no authority to, to take it out of the person responsible for paying for the freight, then this, if you read that, that, that I, I see the witness, so I, I'm not proposing any amendment. I'm just pointing that out, that that may be a problem uh, once this becomes law. I support the intent of this. One dollar per ton is, is nominal, you know, and for, for, the, for the purpose for which it's going to be use, I, I support that, of course, but I just want to make sure that the program is. The chair would be willing to entertain a, a short recess for the three of you to get together and try to see if we can work this out. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Senator Palacios, you still have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, my point of inquiry has been satisfied. Thank you very much. I look over then. The, that will be, that's how we the address in the, in the bill. And in the, I guess, the rules and regs that probably would be set up later on by the council. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On the motion, uh, Senator Tom Adder. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, um, I support the intent of uh, Bill 111, but uh, I do have a lot of questions about the, um, the bill itself. And I'll, I'm just going to go ahead and, and address the questions. And, and if the, uh, I think maybe what I'd like to do is, is pose the questions and then, um, and then either if it's appropriate, maybe the author can yield or we can decide at that point whether to take a brief recess to see how to address those questions. First question that I have is on page three under, um, um, on line 22 there, the duties of the council. And the one duty there is that the council in coordination with the governor of Guam shall review the interagency biosecurity task force work plan adopted in 2009 and to basically I guess make necessary revisions to this so that it is um, it is not at the I guess a plan that that makes mention of USDA APHIS PPQ with the term Guam Invasive Species Council and all that and that um, this plan then is basically going to be revised and then to be submitted to the legislature no later than 60 calendar days from the enactment of this act. Um, and I, I just, the question that I raise is the fact that this council is going to get together. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent that they're going to, you know, revise this biosecurity task force, but there's no provision, sir, for uh, public input. Um, nor does the, the language here require that well, I guess they're going to be working with the governor, so whatever their final product is, I, I guess assumes that the governor will concur, and then it will be sent down to the legislature. But it's, it's, it's going to be a, a piece of work that has to be done, and, and, uh, and to be done within 60 days of enactment. Uh, but there's no provisions for uh, public input in this new uh, plan that is to be developed. The, I guess it's supposed to be called the Guam and I'm not sure what the plan is going to be called, but that's a question that I pose. The second question that I would pose is on this composition of the council. Um, in, on page four, we delineate what the, uh, there's a 12, the council will be a 12 member council. And of course it just says we're going to have a council, but it doesn't really say that we would like to see the, the council convene, you know, we, they, that they should, I would think if we don't tell them when to convene, uh, they don't really have to produce anything until 60 days after enactment, so conceivably they, you know, they can wait till the 59th day to com convene. And I certainly would like to see that, that we put in here language to the effect that the council shall uh, convene its initial meeting on, on a certain date. Uh, on the same page, on line 18 there, paragraph C, it says that the council will be chaired by a newly formed position called the Guam Invasion Speech Coordinator, who will be hired out of the University of Guam under the University Center for Island Sustainability, and that the, the salary for that uh, coordinator slash council chairman uh, will come from the Invasive Species Inspection Fee Fund. Now. Uh, the problem that I see is I don't know if there's money already in this in this in inspection fee fund, and and if there isn't, then we cannot hire this coordinator slash council chairman until we actually get money in there. So uh, so then basically you're gonna have a headless council uh, for until we are able to to raise the the funds necessary to hire this guy. 
But then I, I, I wonder, why would the council be chaired by this newly created position, this coordinator, when as we read further into the bill, we find that it is the Department of Agriculture, the director, that actually does the bulk of the work. Um, the director, I believe, has to develop the budget, has to take it to the legislature so that it can be appropriated, and then a lot of the work that has to be done, uh, that's to be funded by this um, uh, inspection fee fund, is really activities within the Department of Agriculture, which kind of begs the question, then why not make the Department of Agriculture director be the chairman? And maybe that money that's going to be used for that coordinator could probably be used for actually activities of the program. Um, then I go to uh, page 5, and uh, on line 15 there, it talks about the conduct of the meetings. And it talks there on line 15, it says the council shall meet no less than quarterly. Uh, well, it's, it's not clear. Should they meet once quarterly, twice quarterly? Uh, it's not clear. I, I presume it probably meant no less than once quarterly. Um, the, um, on page 6, uh, on line 6, page 6, line 6, it, the last sentence there is not clear. It looks like something is missing. It says, if recommended measures are not authorized by current law, the council shall develop and recommend to the governor through legislative proposals for necessary changes in authority. Uh, some, something seems to be missing there, and I think we need to take a look at that to see how we can tighten that up. The biggest concern that I have with the bill is the economic impact of this $1 fee. Now, it's not clear whether is this a fee of $1 per ton uh, uh, based on a bill of laden. So let's say you have a bill of laden with um, that has 20 containers. And the total weight of the 20 containers comes up to, I don't know, 200 tons. So that would be $200. Um, or is it a dollar per container? And the, I don't know how much weight a container takes. So it's just not clear, um, you know, how is it a dollar per, a dollar per ton per container uh, or per bill of laden or what? And so I'm not clear then, what is this going to cost additional to the consumers out in the community? Now this container full of rice, which I imagine can be quite heavy, um, I, I, I really have no clue. A container filled with 50-pound sacks of rice, is that going to add $100 extra to that container and then result in an increase, a slight increase in the cost of rice out in the community? I would like to get a better idea of what that economic impact is. Um, I, admittedly, I did not read the committee report. I don't know if there is any discussion in there as to what the economic impact is of this fee schedule. And so I, um, I that part for me uh, is probably the most important concern that I have regarding Bill 111. And so, Madam Speaker, I, uh, those are the concerns that I have, and however is best, most efficient to address that, either the author could yield point by point, or we can kind of take a recess here and put our heads together to see how to clarify those and maybe address the concerns that I have raised. I will leave that to the body. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome, uh, Senator Ada. On the motion, are there any other speakers? Senator Rodriguez, you're recognized. Thank you, 
Madam Speaker, um, I um, support the concept of uh, Bill 111, um, although I do also still have some um, questions um, similar to the retiring speaker, um, and perhaps that's something that um, a recess or a or to bring in the individuals here to um, allow us to understand some of the issues more clearly would be um, would be appropriate, Madam Speaker. Um, but before we um, decide to do that, I um, want to add, you know, on on sub on page four on the composition of council. I see that we are um, the composition of about I believe it's about ten individuals is kind of government heavy, and so I wanted to include a member from the Guam Soil and Water Conservation um, District who are really the the people on the ground that I think would bring in their experience and their expertise into this council and hopefully um, bring in the uh, bring in a different perspective and so if um, I'd like to add that um, amendment madam speaker um, on line 14 after center um, add uh, Guam soil and water conservation district so a member from that um, Group. On page four, line what? Line 14. Line 14, so after Mayor's Council of Guam, uh, so it would be instead of N after center, you write delete the N and then put the N after Guam and a member of the Guam Soil Conservation District. That's correct. That's the correct uh, yes. title. Center, we speak on the amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I support the amendment, but um, as we know, there, there's the Northern Soil and Water Conservation District and there's the Southern Soil and Water Conservation District. So if the move of the amendment um, wouldn't mind to have a member from each district, yeah. So one from the Northern Soil and Water Conservation District and then a member to represent the Southern Soil and Water Conservation District. Yes, that's... Um that's correct, Madam Speaker, and so I'd like to amend uh, my amendment to include a member from the Northern and Southern Guam Soil and Water Conservation District. Okay. On, on the amendment, <clears throat> any others? No objections? So ordered. I have one more amendment, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, I, didn't, I don't know if this council, if it, um, this legislation passes, will be considered um, an agency or a board that would fall under the open government law. Okay, and I think that the, um, um, the duties and what they would be tasked to, to do are important that needs public input, needs um, the public to, to understand and know when these meetings will occur. So I wanna add um, on page five, line 19, after the last sentence there that um, meetings of this council shall be um, the open or, or, or word it where the open government law uh, shall apply to meetings of this council just to make it perfectly clear the amendment is on page 5 line 19 after voting members that uh, the open government, uh, open the open government law shall apply to this council. That's correct. Shall apply uh, to meetings of this council. Shall apply to meetings of this council. That's correct. On the amendment, Ron, can you please make sure, Senator, we have those in writing for the clerks? So, on the amendment, without any objections, and so order. On the motion, okay, so let me take a, a brief recess.
is uh, back in session. Uh, we're going to have to bring other individuals in to clarify some things, and several amendments are being prepared, so we're going to recess until 2 o'clock this afternoon. Session. A point of information, uh, Madam Speaker. Yes, Senator Rusbisho. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to offer a point of information before we continue discussions um, on Bill 111-31. Uh, we are, I am in receipt of a letter dated today by the Director of Agriculture uh, who wishes to advise the legislature uh, that the Department of Agriculture is not in support of the substitute uh, version. And I, I stand corrected because earlier I said that the Department of Agriculture is in full support of this bill. But after uh, speaking with them, uh, along with uh, other senators here, Madam Speaker, uh, I want to lay the concerns the body may have in response to this, in respect to this letter, uh, that, that pursuant to subsequent amendments that will be offered on the floor, uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, will be in full agreement and uh, absolutely embraces uh, the concepts and the tenets behind uh, Bill 111-31. So I don't want uh, the Director of Agriculture's uh, memo or letter addressed to me to dissuade uh, anyone in our innate desire to move forward with this particular piece of legislation. So I thank you for allowing me to clarify that and offer this as a point of information. Thank you, uh, Senator Rispicio. On the motion, on the main motion, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, recognize Speaker Wampat. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, in line, of course, of what uh, our Majority Leader had uh, relayed to us, and in several discussions, yes, with, uh, with everyone, all the stakeholders here, and, and also the, the time in which we had a, a recess to kind of vet this subject among our, ourselves. And, and, and I think there's uh, fairly much, I mean, ag agreement to uh, what, you know, we want to do here. In, so if you look at page four, then, of the bill, is that on uh, sub item C, and that's where it says that the council shall be cha chaired by a newly formed position called uh, the Guam Invasive Species uh, Coordinator. And, and, and although it is the title in which the individual, the coordinator, will be working with the council, but rather than it be hired out of the University of Guam under the University Center for Island Sustainability, but rather uh, on line um, 19, where it says who will be, but strike hired all the way out to the end, and it will say who will be the entomologist of the Guam Department of Agriculture. The reason why I, I say this, uh, Madam Speaker, because is that several things that actually had happened in the past, like in the 27th Guam legislature, when PPQ was transferred out, and the only in two positions that they left with agriculture was the uh, entomologist and uh, the cashier. and. Uh, and what had happened uh, also in, uh, in some other uh, discussion is that when, that what, the reason for this rather is to have this separate individual high enough in the totem pole uh, with the government who is able then to pull all of these uh, scientists or the techno, uh, technocrats or the, the scientists in, in essence uh, to come to a table who will be part of this uh, council. And we know that they're not normally like directors uh, who will be attending these meetings, but I'm sure these directors would rather send the specialists, the scientists, the technocrats instead uh, to, to attend and be a part of this council. And it has to be an individual, of course, high enough, like I said, in the totem pole that will be able to do this. And, and, and it has to be a position similar to what we have here on the island where we have a, a territorial epidemiologist, we have a territorial uh, entomologists, we have a territorial uh, veterinarian, and normally these are, are individuals, like I said, in the government with a high enough position to be able to pull some of these departments and agencies together, so, uh, or, and the councils, and uh, the council members, so the amendment is very simple, really, and that is to instead strike everything out after B, and the hired all the way to the end, and that, that position will be the entomologist of the Guam Department of Education of agriculture, which means uh, an, uh, collateral duties in which uh, that individual then will be holding. So that's, that's my proposed am amendment. On the motion, it would change. I 
know what, what it is is that on page four, line I'm 19, see. scratch out from uh, strike out higher to the end of to line the 21. end of sustainability. No, to the end of line 21, and then it says who will be and the new. Uh, item and the, the amendment is the entomologist of the Guam Department of Agriculture. And, and okay, and maybe a little bit more if I can explain then too, is that, and the reason why I didn't use that the salaries will come from the Guam Inspe uh, Invasive Species Inspection uh, Fee Fund is because this is a position that currently exists in the government. And remember now, we're just starting new and we want to be able to that when they're able to call their meeting, because if you read further on, is that they need to be able to meet and that person is going to be a chair. And what are you gonna do when you don't have an individual, you don't have the money rather to go out and hire. Right now we have a person on board who, who, who can easily fill that position. And what's even more important, which is uh, what I'm going to introduce later on, is that with these uh, monies, then only then, could we then uh, uh, go out and actually in the creation of the biosecurity division is to give them the support that they need. Many times this legislature, we get accused of creating these divisions, mandating some issues, but then these are mandates without any funding. Well, this time that will not be the case. So uh, we have an individual, there's funding already, it is recognized, it's high enough in the totem pole to be able to pull this so that somebody down there is not gonna say, oh, you know, I'm not gonna listen to that person. Absolutely not, this is really very important. We need to take this very seriously. And I think that with all these different uh, members who are gonna be part of the council, needs to make sure that the word gets down to, to everyone because this is a very serious, uh, you know, thing that we're dealing with, which is the invasive species. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Yes, as a Senator Special one, a, sen a Speaker Wampat, just for clarification's sake, the um, the uh, after on line twenty after the word sustainability, you still wanted to no, uh, it's all delete the to, all the way up to yes, from fee hired, fund. Hired on line nineteen, all the way to the end of line twenty one, which is fund. Yes. Okay. And, and if I may, can I just also say, because for, you know, I remember sometimes, you know how it is, we tell people about certain positions, some of these uh, really long titles that we can't even sometimes pronounce, you know, and what do, do they really do? And for uh, an entomologist, really are biological scientists who study insects and, you know, so, and, and pests. And, and of course, you know, we're seeing a lot of that happening, especially Guam, we're going to be uh, affected by this because of the military buildup and then as a result of some of these insects and pests that come into uh, the island, some, what they do is they pollinate our plants uh, or they can destroy some of our indigenous plants. Uh, they can also, also physically harm humans and pets and livestock and wildlife. Uh, you, you know, we see this happen of course in Hawaii and, and you, you know if, for every one of us who've taken a trip off island, heading into Hawaii, they're really big on this to make sure that we don't bring in or carry any of these, you know, pests, possible, you know, pests to the island that can uh, destroy our, our, our ferns, our plants, our fauna, you know, even, even our livestock and, and even uh, human lives. Uh, you, you, know, you know that we've all heard about that one container that came in that had a container full of spiders Fortunately, you know, none of those were released, at least that's what they're telling us, that actually made it out and onto our, uh, the island. But there are other poisonous, you know, uh, pests out there, like the, the black widow uh, spider that we don't want, you know, to come in here. So we've been very fortunate. We need to keep that vigilance up. We need to be able to support, you know, such a, a, a group as this so that we don't uh, have to deal with it when it's really, almost too late, like the rhinoceros beetle that came, you, you know about the brown tree snakes, snakes that came in, they literally sneaked in. Uh, so, you know, we, we gotta be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you get the gist. I, I got the gist, Speaker, thank you very much. You very much. Senator Respicio, you're recognized on the Judy Wampet Amendment. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I understand the uh, Speaker's concerns and um, her intention uh, to want to make the uh, entomologist uh, be the chair of this council. 
uh, and in arguing that uh, he's high enough in the totem pole, uh, this is where I stand to uh, disagree. Uh, granted, he is a territorial entomologist, but if you uh, look at the composition of the council, you have the directors of agriculture and customs and quarantine. Uh, and so how do you have someone who is subordinate to another member of the council be the chair of that same council? Uh, and so I think, um, and also fundamentally what the previous uh, speaker and the mover of this amendment is bringing up uh, is really where rubber hits the road in terms of who uh, is going to lead this council. And I think the genesis uh, behind uh, having this position uh, funded by this um, funding stream and having it under the University of Guam's University Center for Island Sustainability as the, co as the chairman of this council, I think that's where we can guarantee someone who's going to be in a third party objective kind of position uh, so that it's not more science based than, than border protection things that customs does and so you're not uh, going to di be diluting anyone's uh, authority. So I, I object to the amendment of having the entomologist chair the council uh, simply because the entomologist uh, still responds or has to be answerable to the director uh, who's also in the council. So mechanically I, I think it might be problematic so if we can uh, give that a little bit more thought. Thank you Madam Speaker. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on the amendment? If not, there was an objection to the uh, Juan Pet Amendment. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. All those in favor of the amendment? Five. Five. Motion fails. S Speaker Juan Pet, you still have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, the other amendment I have uh, is on Section 5 for the Biosecurity Division. And with this uh, position is that we are authorizing the, uh, the department then with, to be able to set up a biosecurity division. They're authorized to do that and to provide for uh, you know, inspection, quarantine, eradication of invasive species. However, what, what we've not done in this case is actually to allow them to be able to uh, actually hire uh, these individuals to fulfill these positions. I understand that maybe long term down the road is that if they're going to be fully operational, that maybe could go up to as high as 50 individuals. But because we're starting off, we've got to start with something, and I'm sure that because in the in the, uh, in the bill, if you look on page seven, it also said that the Director of Agriculture, the Department of Agriculture, shall prepare a budget plan you know, to include projected personnel. So that can take care uh, of, of the much uh, down the future where the full complement of individuals that will be needed. So the amendment I have, uh, I have would add a new, two new subsections, a B and a C. And the B is that the Department of Agriculture is hereby authorized to establish and hire up to a total of 15 personnel to fill positions in the GDOA Biosecurity Division to conduct biosecurity inspections, quarantine, and eradication measure, measures in accordance with the Guam Invasive Species Management Plan. And then uh, the botanists and plant pathologists for the Department of Agriculture shall also work in conjunction with the Biosecurity Division on development and updating of the Guam Invasive Species Management Plan and the inspection, quarantine, and eradication duties of the division. So that's 15 individuals currently when we talk about uh, those individuals at the, at the border. But then beyond the border now is what we need to also uh, be concerned with and who then will be able to do that. So that's where subsection C is and that the Department of Agriculture is hereby authorized now to establish and hire up to a total of 12 personnel, personnel at, uh, positions in the inland pest management uh, section to conduct biosecurity inspections, quarantine, and eradication measures in accordance to the Guam Invasive Species Management Plan. So the first is, is to have these uh, individuals under the biosecurity uh, division, the individuals that are considered border patrol, and then a C is that beyond the border and they start to come inland, and that's the other group of 12 uh, other positions. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And then these positions 
will, yes, be funded by uh, the, uh, the um, Invasive uh, Species Fund. Fund. On the speaker want that amendment, are there anyone else wishing to speak on the motion? Objection. There's been an objection. Senator Ada, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, um, I'm just getting a little concerned about how, what is the basis for hiring 15 personnel um, to fill positions in the biosecurity division and then uh, 12 additional positions for the inland pace pest management section. I, I'm just, what is the basis for those numbers? Um, so maybe if the author would yield. There's an inquiry. Speaker Wampad, would you like to answer that? I, I'll attempt to. Uh, Madam uh, Speaker, proceed. in my um, in my discussions, at least with uh, you know not just agriculture prior to PPQ being transferred out, but to uh, a customs and quarantine who received these individuals and were also able to to keep the monies that came with it. But here we are now wanting to set this up with nothing, and that's you know. And but what they did is that they've actually had up to about 30 something, there might be a little bit more, but that's the number of, of positions that they had that they lost uh, to customs and quarantine and were basically left only with two, like I said, which is just the entomologist and the cashier. Now, the, the positions that are being created here uh, is about 30, 27 positions, doesn't even come close to what they originally had okay, to thank carry you. out Thank you very much, Madam, Madam Chair. Madam Speaker, I, I just, uh, the concern that I have is that, you know, Bill 111, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, for responding to my question, um, is really to establish the Guam Invasive Species Council. And here we are now fleshing out the biosecurity division, we're fleshing out another, and it seems to me that, you know, that probably warrants its own public hearing in a separate bill, or we should at least give the council, uh, give the council the opportunity to sit down and review these matters and uh, determine if in fact uh, 15, I mean because they had 15 before, uh, doesn't necessarily follow that they need 15 today. Uh, so I would just, you know, I, I, I guess the, the, the issue of authorizing them to hire 15 27 personnel here uh, is, is germane in some respects, but I guess on the other hand, it is not germane to Bill 111 because Bill 111 just seeks to establish a Guam Invasive Species Council. So I object to the amendment. There has been an objection to the motion placed by Speaker Wanpat. Anyone else wishing to speak on the amendment? If not, I'm going to call for the vote. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Speaker Wampat, you can close. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, you know, Madam Speaker, when you look at the bill, and I can understand uh, what the previous speaker has said, is that, you know, this would require another uh, public hearing, a standalone bill, and granted, maybe so. But, you know, you opened the door when you created Section 15, um, Section 5, and where it says here the biosecurity division has been authorized. What the amendment says is to authorize them as well. It doesn't say that you're going to immediately go out there and hire because we know that the funding is not there. So they're authorized, just like the way Congress would do that. You authorize now, next year then you can, we would appropriate. So that's what this is. It's not cast in stone that this is what it's going to be. They definitely can come in and change it. Don't forget, look at lines 27 to 29, and that exactly gives them that opportunity when they submit a budget and to, when they prepare the budget for them to then project exactly what their needs are. Thank you, Madam Okay, on that motion, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion fails. Speaker Wampat, you still have the floor, Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam S uh, Speaker. Uh, I, I, apparently, you know, I guess, uh, hmm. 
I don't know what to say, actually, at, at this point in time, uh, Madam Speaker. I mean, of course, what we always try to do is to make sure that what we, we do is we actually try to listen to everybody to be able to do the best that we can. Uh, I understand that there was an objection, not just by the department's going to be affected by this. I understand even the department who could be uh, affected by it, whatever the reasons are. And I appreciate uh, the, the, uh, the chairman, I mean, the author of the bill when he you know, was open to a lot of, uh, uh, you know, amendments, of course, to always try to make it, you know, stronger. Uh, I don't know uh, what, what, you know, we want to do in this case. If it's just to build uh, the shell of, you know, what we're looking at, but nothing else uh, uh, in that shell, then maybe, uh, you know, we can anticipate a, a second bill, but I, I just, you know, one thing I, I don't appreciate, of course, that I, that I don't like doing, of course, is being able to, to, to create something almost kind of um, uh, incomplete because I know that there are concerns that we're going to be dealing sometime uh, in the near future about, uh, about PPQ. I know that when the budget comes in, there will be a lot of questions about what both departments have been doing or will be capable of doing. Um, either way, uh, Madam Speaker, in, in its current form right now, the way it is, I can honestly tell you I cannot support this bill. Thank you. Speaker, Madam Speaker, I'd like to rise to a point of information. Please uh, state your point of information. Yeah, I'm a little confused because of the different uh, representations being made with regards to the discussion in this bill. and which department or agency supporting it or not, I did receive uh, for the information of the body at 12.16 this afternoon, uh, May, May 5th, 2001, a letter uh, from the Department of Agriculture, and it is to respectfully advise you and the Committee on Rules, Foreign Affair, Rules Federal and Foreign Affairs, Micronesian Affairs, and Human and Natural Resources that we are not in support of the Substitute Bill 111-31. As it appeared, the bill is a complete revamping of the original bill that was already heard. Some of the provisions of the substitute bill has raised some serious concerns that have not been addressed in the public hearing. In this regard, we are urging you and the committee to consider holding off any further discussion of the substitute bill until another legislative hearing can be conducted to assure that our concerns and those of the general public are appropriately considered we understand that this may be a last minute attempt to raise this matter, but there are so much, there are so much at stake that may have some long standing negative effects in the important things that we do here at the Department of Agriculture. So just Masi, respectfully yours, Marikita Taitagui, Director, Department of Agriculture. So, Madam Speaker? I'm, I'm just rising to you. Yeah, it's. Okay, yes, I. I, I I recognize your point of information. If it's not, not, it's not yeah. what they've reported. Something totally different. Yes, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm not sure if the speaker was in the hall at the time. Uh, Senator Respicio rose uh, to to say that that matter has been taken care of. Um, the Director of Agriculture is here and is in favor of the amendment that's going to be proffered um, shortly uh, to deal with their concern. Senator Special. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And along those lines, I've uh, asked the Director of Agriculture uh, to submit uh, another letter uh, advising that they're okay with the version on the floor. I mean, the uh, commitment that we have is to make sure that the agencies involved are, are comfortable with what we're doing. And uh, just uh, for purpose of the body's um, information and for those following at home, Madam Speaker, their concern was that they didn't want the invasive species coordinator to be an employee of the University of Guam. And so there would be an amendment that would be um, offered subsequent um, to which they're uh, totally in support of. Appreciate that, Madam Speaker, which kind of goes back to my original motion that perhaps we should have started with the committee on a whole on this, given all this people speaking for everybody else and, you know, private conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations, which everybody's not privy to but has to be relayed to us. So I apologize if I was redundant in that. Uh, information, but and uh, may not have been in earlier, but it just goes to reiterate, I think, that if we had everybody sitting up there, then we can all be told the same thing at the same time, and it would have saved us a lot of time. We're going to take a brief recess.
Pretty sure you recognize. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I move that we uh, suspend discussion on Bill 111-31 uh, uh, with the understanding that uh, when you convene this legislature back into session at uh, 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, uh, that at that time I would be making a motion to resolve in the Committee of the Whole uh, for purposes of addressing this bill, uh, given the uh, concerns raised by the good uh, gentleman from Barragata, that we'd like to put the directors uh, on the record uh, to really see how they feel about the evolution of this uh, substituted version. And, and uh, you're not going to find uh, any objection from uh, any one of us uh, here in this body. So on that motion without any objections to order, Thank Senator, you. can you just also make yeah, the announcement in terms oh. of who then, since some of them are out there listening, to expect to be here tomorrow And that um, my office will be uh, noticing uh, the Director of Agriculture uh, as well as uh, asking the Director of Customs and Quarantine uh, and maybe a representative from the front office to uh, participate in the Committee of the Whole. Okay. So, Thank and you very much. My next motion, Madam Speaker, is a notwithstanding motion to reorder the second reading file to have uh, the matter of Bill 70 uh, placed at the top of the session agenda, second reading file. Yes, um, okay. And, and then we'll, I'll yes, be making back. then my next motion, if that's... A, adopted would be to resolve in the Committee of the Whole. So my oh, first motion is we to... We are on... Uh, we're uh, 70 is next? Yeah, no, no. We've been on 70 yesterday, okay. and we are in Committee of the Whole. Okay, so then we're I... We're just going to continue this afternoon at 3. So I move then that we uh, resolve into the Committee of the Whole We are. We are already in Committee no, of the Whole. Oh, to go no, back down? Rose, oh, because you so went we back have, up. Okay. We have to go back so down. So to, to head back down. Okay. Yeah, for my motion is to resolve in the Committee of the Whole for purposes of addressing uh, Bill number 70-30. On that motion then without any objections ordered. Speaker Bet. Thank you, Ensign Dismasi. Um, Madam uh, Chair. Madam Chair, yesterday uh, we suspended discussion on this. The amendment I had made was to delete um, section 1118.0 uh, administrative penalties in its entirety. Um, again, Madam Speaker, uh, one of the uh, concerns, of course, I had. Uh, is this um, relationship then between the financial, the concern, the financial remuneration to the department based upon the penalty that they impose being reserved for the division itself? And it's really the same philosophy that is applied almost universally in government is that uh, when you impose penalty, you try to ensure that the imposition of of penalty is not tied to any financial gain be, and that there's an incentive to impose the penalty. And so the, that is why, for example, the traffic fines that are imposed on our drivers who violate our traffic laws on Guam are issued uh, and imposed upon by the Guam Police Department, but the money doesn't go to them because it doesn't, you know, if it did, then we'd see tickets galore every time they want a pay raise or or uh, overtime paid and so forth, that we really have an obligation on, our, on the part of our government to, to disassociate uh, any kind of conflict uh, on the imposition of, of uh, and the, um, the citations uh, by regulatory agencies. I mean, that's just a universal philosophy that uh, is, is tried to, in, in almost all instances, adhered to by governments in our society. And so, in this respect, that's one of the concerns, is that it goes against that philosophy. The second concern that I have is, of course, you know, we're imposing requirements for these 
uh, child care facilities, uh, there are penalties associated with regards to violations uh, that uh, are even of greater consequence to these child care agencies than just a fine. Um, and that is the loss of their license, uh, being shut down, and other types of uh, ways in which we can ensure compliance by the child care centers and the individuals operating these centers that will provide for me, in my opinion, the same, if not a better incentive to uh, ensure that they follow the law and that they operate in a manner that is safe for the care of children that are entrusted to them. Uh, as we've heard many times, the business itself is not a lucrative business. It's not something you're going to get rich on. Uh, and that they do this for the care uh, and the value they place in contributing to our society by providing good, safe uh, uh, programs uh, and facilities uh, for parents who need to go to work and need for somebody that they can entrust their children to. And so until such time, I think that and we are raising some of the requirements that increase the cost of these uh, uh, entities. And better to put the money into their own facility, their training, and so forth, um, and have them directed at that than be subjected to these penalties. Uh, again, that is the, uh, the reason why I'm offering this. We're there to, to work with them, not to penalize them. Uh, and so uh, I think until we have a better track record with regards to seeing how all of these regulations uh, get implemented, uh, until we see a pattern uh, that uh, I think the best cure for somebody who violates this that endanger children's lives, because every violation uh, is to take them out of the business uh, through the, the licensing process than to just impose a fine and threaten them with a fine. I think that, uh, that that would be a better way uh, of dealing with this uh, and a better way to protect our children. Uh, and so in that regard, um, that's the uh, rationale for my offer. The other thing I do want to uh, um, state for the record is that uh, the Guam Early Learning Council itself, in the review of the rules and regulations, uh, in the past had recommended the deletion of these administrative fines themselves. So this is not something that is just coming from me, but the association, the, the council that we're trying to enshrine into law in the development of what we have here today had recommended uh, during its, uh, its hearing process, its deliberation of them, uh, and in working together with the other um, stakeholders uh, that they that we remove the fines and and put the uh, uh, sanctions to be in the area of of the licensing and 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 other administrative matters without the financial penalty so again it is reacting also to that recommendation that I'm making this amendment uh, in this bill thank you uh, speaker uh Pangilinan will go ahead and recognize on the amendment, Senator Adda, Tom Adda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, uh, I, I support the amendment that uh, has been made to strike the penalty section. Um, and my rationale for that basically is that uh, this can well, it, it was already the preceding speaker had mentioned that there is really probably uh, more significant disincentives uh, to to or incentives to to stay in compliance, and that is the possibility of losing their license, uh, not at the end or, or or inability to get it renewed. Uh, the other part, of course, is that we've seen in many cases where it may be less expensive to continue staying out of compliance. Uh, than it is to come into compliance, at least for a certain period of time. Uh, so uh, from that standpoint, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, necessarily, I do not necessarily subscribe to these punitive, to these penalties simply because I, I, I just think that the, the, the threat of losing the license, getting it revoked, or not getting it renewed is enough of a disincentive that I think the facilities. The other part, of course, is that, uh, you know, I, I really believe that I, I go on the premise that the, um, that the facilities go there to operate. And when they wake up in the morning, they, they wake up and they open their doors uh, with the intent of providing good child care services to the, um, to the, to the uh, children in their care because they really do, they really do care about these kids. And, uh, and not because, well, we need to do these because of these penalties. So. Um, I, I certainly support the deletion of the penalty section. Thank you, Senator Ada. Anyone else wishing to speak on the amendment? If not, um, are there any objections? Well, Speaker Juan Pad, you're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Is that if, if the, I mean, what would happen then if, let's say, these provisions are removed, that there is then a, no way in which now the director can impose, you know, any kind of fine uh, for any violations, then what's the other, what's the recourse that the, the department can take? Uh, can you just go in there then just suspend uh, operations and then eventually close down uh, and let's say no fines uh, whatsoever uh, pretty much what you stated are the outcomes um, the suspension denial revocation uh, of a license that doesn't involve any type of uh, fines so c can you i mean i i know that uh, there's a graduated uh, um, fine here you know with, with the different class of uh, violations and uh, is there also then a the same steps as well for a suspension to final closure yes yes there well? is it's it's um, there are specific or, or there are sections in this bill that uh, so provides that due process to, yes for due process now w would these then uh, fines instead, a financial uh, penalty, be below that step prior to a suspension, or would this be, you know, for recidivism that then finally it's, this is the dollar amount? Do you, do you, do you have this either parallel to, uh, you know, the, the fines versus suspension? or is it graduated as well to the point where then now you really have no other recourse but to shut him down completely or go to court? I think that the opportunities for um, due process is there in the part of um, the provider on um, both the administrative uh, uh, sections that we spelled out along with the uh, other areas of denial, suspension, and, or revocation of license. Um, I mean, we don't we we don't expect that we we're going to get, for lack of a better word, trigger happy with um, imposing this for the sake of building up um, a fine, you know, fines because we know that we're we're not going to gain much out of these out of these fines, uh, and I know that's one of the uh, the integrity there is what's being questioned, uh, in addition to the integrity of the use of the funds that. Um, unless we state clearly the use of, of the funds, what that's going to go to. Um, and I think we discussed that yesterday um, to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, but for the sake of the department, um, you know, there are those um, realizations that even if we close the center um, as a final outcome, there's still the opportunity, um, and, and we've experienced this for those same um, individuals um, to come back in a different function, if not as a director or as an owner, but maybe as a staff member or what have you. Um, and there are those cases where there have been repeated, repeated um, 
um, violations of, this, of the same uh, findings. Uh, but for the most part, um, it's, you know, as mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, it's just to give us that leverage for those more um, serious uh, cases that come before us. Uh, and we do recognize that if it does involve uh, uh, any type of criminal um, findings, that we would have to do our part in terms of ensuring that the proper authorities um, are contacted and a report is made. So if uh, the motion then to delete this section succeeds then, uh, some of these types of violations, I was going through to see if they are on uh, grounds for denial, suspension, and revocation, are not here. Would we need then to look at some of these violations and now make it a part of a reason for denial so that then they rather than if any of these things should happen, any of these violations, that they're not grounds for denial, suspension, or revocation of a, a license? Well, I think some of, those, some of the causes and, um, are, are spelled out in some of those other sections related to denial, suspension, or, or revocation. What's lacking there is the, uh, the fines that come with that. So that's, because that's pretty looking, much the distinction. Yeah, because I, you know, I was looking at page uh, 59, and tell the truth, I like this one in particular. I mean, not so much the, the fine, but I mean, gosh, if this should just happen to, should be for everybody. The, on lines four and five, the use of corporal punishment or frightening or humiliating methods of control or discipline. I think that should be for everybody anyway who, you know, supervises children, uh, that uh, there's gonna be some type of, uh, you know, action taken as a, as a result of that. I mean, th that's not there, of course. The abuse of, you know, is there. I, 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 see, I see all that. And uh, so, I mean, there's just gonna be some major, I think, ma uh, work to make sure. Like, for example, on page 61, if we delete that section on line eight and f number four, the applicant or licensee failed to pay a fine, then that's not gonna be the case because now there is, there won't be that fine. Am I correct or wrong? You're correct. So I mean, I don't know, of course, um, Ms. whether Mr. Chairman, uh, we just got to figure out how we're going to do this to make sure then that uh, some of these things, these violations that in which, that would be my concerns that some of these violations that if they're no longer going to be there, that we need to move them over to the other section. Or maybe another consideration is that rather than maybe just delete the fines themselves, the dollar figure, rather than just getting rid of it entirely and just say that this will be grounds the first class that may be uh, class one, that it be a revoca revocation of the license class two, that that should be a suspension, and is there a class three? Class three, that that will be a denial, I mean, rather than just, and just remove the dollar amount, but we'll, we'll see how that, how the, the first uh, amendment goes through, whether it passes or fail, and then that would be something maybe to, to consider. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Speaker Juan um, We're still on the Pangolinan Amendment, and I have Senator Frank Blast and Senator Palacios. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. You know, Madam Chair, not, not wanting to rehash the entire conversation that we had yesterday with regards to this amendment, but uh, maybe that would help to, to uh, allay some of the concerns uh, by, the, by the previous speaker um, with regards to you know, a, a number of the, for lack of a better term, offenses that, that, that are enumerated in, in as far as what, you know, uh, what, uh, what can be subjected to the administrative penalties. Um, most, if not all, uh, can be subject to not only civil but criminal uh, proceedings. And so um, my point of supporting the amendment uh, or, or the, by, by, by the good senator from Barragata to delete the entire section is, is, is the concern with regards to um, the appearance you know, of, of an individual being du doubly charged um, for, for, for committing either a civil or criminal criminal offense on this thing. So 
there are civil and criminal proceedings um, that are much, actually much more harsher than, than, than what could be, be provided. It does not take away from the ability of the department to be able to address those concerns. Um, I think that uh, maybe the other, in, 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 in lieu of the, the department being able to, and you're right, Lydia, I have to agree with you. This is not, this is not a, a get rich quick type thing, but uh, to, not only to, to, to allay those concerns with regards to that, but also it helps that, that added protection to the department as well as to the aid to those individuals that have to be uh, to make those decisions, but more so, you know, the, 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 those individuals that can be victimized by, by such incidences, it is actually being investigated by proper authorities and, uh, and adjudicated properly, whether it's civilly or criminally. So uh, I hope that, um, Madam Speaker, with regards to some of the concerns you got with regards to whether or not there are, is there uh, other ways to be able to deal with this? They, they, most, if not all, again, are either civil or criminal in nature and can be dealt with accordingly by, by the appropriate authorities. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're going to move to uh, Senator Blas. Senator Palacios on Pangilinan Amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I support the Pangilinan Amendment for several reasons. First of all, of course, uh, the way this uh, section uh, is noted here is that we have to clean out what is a uh, violation of criminal codes or uh, fire codes because there are authorities already that would handle that. Uh, I, to some extent, I do support some kind of, uh, of fine, but I guess with the deletion of this, we can still come back and do those uh, violations of administrative regulation and perhaps then maybe consider that at that point and we can consider that as a standalone amendment or triple A process by public health, and that can come later. Uh, but I believe personally, Madam, Madam Chair, that there's a greater deterrence for com, uh, uh, f from, from a threat of suspension or closure for compliance than deterrence from, sus from fines. I mean, I think uh, as a business person, uh, I, I, I'd rather pay a fine and continue to be in business and just recover what I paid in fine in two or three days than be suspended for maybe 10 days. So the deterrence really for compliance is greater with that. And if you have a fine, uh, a, a provision for, for fines, there might be the inclination to just fine and not suspend and then fine and fine and fine. And so at the same time, the, this is very, there's, there's not that much major impact on encouraging the business, I guess, the, the child care center to comply because uh, they're still paying the fine and as far as public health is concerned, they still have the revenue building up. So I'm not, I'm not saying I distrust public health, but there is the potential for that or at least the perception that that might be happening and we don't need that. And so I think at this point, uh, it, it, it's proper to uh, delete this, uh, not meaning that it cannot be reconsidered later on. And I still say at this point that I, I, I support the deletion, but at some point I, I support the concept of administrative fine as a separate, uh, maybe through the AAA process and build it into this and connect it with the, this uh, statute. That's my comment, Madam uh, Chairman. See, too small, see, uh, Senator Plushes. On the Pangolinan Amendment, are there anyone else wishing to speak? If not, Speaker Ben, would you like to close? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Smasi, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I just want to reiterate once again that uh, this is not a reflection of, of what I uh, uh, believe is, you know, with regards to the staff at Public Health uh, and how they operate. As I said and preface my comments, this concept is, is something that's universally practiced among city and state governments is that you just, you know, you remove the, the opportunity for uh, the general public or the customers to question the motivations be f behind the imposition of financial uh, penalties when the gain or, the, or that financial penalty goes to the person imposing the fine. And, and that's why we try to separate that. So I in no way by, by removing this provision think that public health could not be fair, is not fair, and is not doing uh, an ethical uh, 
you know, practice within its, um, within its operations. It is not for that purpose. It is just something that will insulate them from being charged or being uh, accused of, of doing something because they get to use the money for their purpose of their division and department and things like that. So it is just best to be cautious in that. And I think, as again, I just you know reiterate that this is kind of a universal principle uh, in in civil uh, in civil governments and civics that you just don't do that. It's it's just like you know in business in the private sector. When I was working in the private sector, you know we just never had the person who received the money and counted it make the deposit himself too. Not because we didn't trust them, but that's just the caution that you want to know so that when the deposit doesn't match the thing. You don't absolutely say he took it because it's two different people. There's a check and balance and, and the opportunity to remove, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the people from those conflicting situations. Uh, and I think it's, we're doing, I certainly uh, want to do this in, in the best interest of, of the department and the division that's in it and its employees in their relationship with the people that they regulate. Uh, so rather than becoming adversarial, it becomes more of a partnership of ensuring that the operations meet and conform to the guidelines because of the desire to make sure that the children are getting the proper care uh, and to assist these uh, child care center providers and services uh, you know, in the provision of, of, and com of the services and in compliance to the rules and regulations. Thank you very much. One to uh, Speaker Pengelinan. With that being said, on the motion, are there any objections? Being no objections, motion carries. We are now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's one more amendment by uh, Palacios. Uh, thank Palacios. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, the, it has to do with uh, page 42. Uh, page 42, line 24, when uh, wait, for the term, it says here that uh, an, an uh, equipment shall be age appropriate, durable, mid recommendation of the of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety, and uh, including the latest version of the CPSC handbook for public playground safety. And then I found out that the this is a 57-page uh, handbook. That actually is a guideline, and to my knowledge, no, no jurisdiction in this country adopted this in its entirety. And looking at section 11.80, which is on the material and equipment on beginning on, on line 24, it is to adopt this. And this is not even recommendation, these are guidelines. And it's clearly here on page two of the guideline that it is a guideline. Uh, for the supervision, let me see, on page two, it, it, and I, the, the handbook provides some guidelines on supervision, supervisory practice that adults should follow, should. And all through this guideline, 57 page guideline, it says should, or it would reiterate how it's being practiced elsewhere. And so, my, 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 my amendment to this uh, is simple is that you know at the end of durable on page 42 put a comma and then just to the extent practical and consistent with the guide uh, to the extent practical it, it has to be consistent with the guidelines provided the uh, guidelines of the US and I can I can write that so so again on page 42 after the word durable. Comma, then say to the extent practical, it, because it says that the selection and quantity and so forth, comma, to the extent practical, comma, to the extent practical, consistent with okay. the guidelines of the US. And that way, the, the guidelines remain guidelines. And they can be substituted and not necessarily the, uh, the tire, but you can substitute that with just a, I guess with a canvas and something. Uh, the point is, though, that in all this 57 page, the term should is always used. So this is actually not, this is a guideline from which 
a jurisdiction can select and adopt as its rule for that matter. But to just take the entire handbook and say this is it, we adopt everything, because that is actually what, what would be the end result if we adopt 11, section 11.08.0, which is under material and equipment. If we, had, if, we had, if we accept Appendix F, which is this one, then whatever is in this 57 page, we adopt that as the standard. And some of us, I'm not, I would say that I don't think that anybody here would know I I every detail of all of this, each page, with all the dimension of, and so forth. That, and I would like to amend that it only be served as a guideline, and that as much as possible, if the child care center, you know, can can follow to the extent practical some of these guidelines. Yes. So that once we adopt it, then it, you, you know, it, it, it's a standard. Senator Palacio, so I'm, so I'm reading it right. After the word durable, you're going to put comma, comma, mean and to the extent practical. Then scratch out mid recommendations, because these are not recommendations. I mean, if one can can say that it's that guideline is synonymous with recommendation, probably, but let us stick to the term guidelines because that is actually what it is. So I would say that you strike out mid recommendations and right. just replace, replace that with say, insert and there, and to the extent practical, consistent with the guidelines and then of the United States Consumer, Consumer Product Safety Commission, including the latest version of the handbook for, for public playground safety. Clerks, Appendix F. Yeah. Okay. Would it be practicable or practical? Uh, to the extent practical. Okay. Yeah. Senator Respicio, you're recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Chair. I, I agree with the amendment. I was going to suggest the use of the word practicable instead of practical. Uh, because practicable is capable of being used and so, so you want to amend the amendment yeah okay on on the word from practical to practicable are there any objections no objection motion carries thank you senator respicio senator rodriguez you're you're on the amended on the palacios amendment amendment thank you amendment um, madam chair i um don't uh, object to the um amendment but I think if we say, you know, to the extent practical, then still public health will still have the, um, that uh, determination on what is practical. And so, you know, I, I know what the heartache, the heartache is here in requiring child care uh, providers to follow this very stringent um, handbook. And so, um, you know, I want to ask public health, is there uh, another set of guidelines that um, you know that could be used, or because if not, then I think I would like to make uh, an amendment, uh, since we know what the I think the intent of Senator Palacios was to to not make this thing where it's mandatory, but if it's something that the providers are able to, to you know to do, then that's what they'll do. So please, if you can. Okay. Thank you, Senator Rodriguez. Um, for, for us, I, I, I don't know of any other type of guideline other than that recommended by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. As a matter of fact, most of the criteria or safety standards that has been adopted by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission actually came out from the, this other group. That it's the ASTM standards. It's, um, it's a standard that's been used uh, to test certain types of criteria, whether it's a shock absorbent uh, material and what that type of material should be. Um, I even went to the extent in 2009 to contact some of the, ma the leading manufacturers of playground equipment. And it's interesting to note that almost all manufacturers of playground equipment will reference this handbook. And for us as consumers, we're all consumers in one, one way or the other, 
You know, we always look when we buy an electrical device, uh, any type of product, there's a manufacturer specifications. And a lot of the manufacturer specifications are, are there to protect consumers. And, and that's what we're seeing. These manufacturers of playground equipment reference the handbook. And I mean, I spoke to Little Tykes, step two, and they all reference it um, with respect to surface materials or proper installation. So this handbook, is, it's, it goes far beyond just shock absorbency materials as far as surface materials. It talks about proper installation of playground equipment. It talks about, um, you know, that playground equipment should be made of durable materials that are, are not within any, containing any sharp points. And it all leads back to protecting the children, you know, making sure that they're safe. And, and the fact that they're saying many, many falls and, and emergency situations with children are due to, you know, falling from a playground material is something that's of concern to us. We know, because we, I know of one parent who had a child who actually suffered a concussion from falling off a public uh, playground equipment in a school. And that child had to be brought to, to the hospital. So those type of situations are occurring. And um, can I ask, what are the other institutions here? Do they follow this as a, as a mandatory guideline, like the, the DOE schools and, and, and any other school that you guys regulate? That's a, good, that's a very good question. Um, we did some um, questionnaires with uh, some of the schools, and we do know for a fact that Head Start out of the public uh, Guam Department of Education is, is uh, insta installing public playground materials that meet the specifications of this handbook. So they are building playgrounds uh, in the public school systems to meet this criteria. We've also contacted uh, the military installations, DODEA, and they've also um, uh, let, let it, informed us that they are also following the handbook. Um, you know, as far as the, the public playgrounds within our Guam parks, um, I, know, I don't know what criteria Parks and Rec used or whoever installed those playgrounds like that in Paseo or down at EPAL, but it's interesting to note that if you look at those playground material, the surface material under there, there's sand. And sand is an acceptable surface material. And there must have been a reason why they put it in there. I mean, I never really got to, to speak with Department of Parks and Rec why, but I'm thinking they must have followed some guideline. So I'm, I'm asking, is there, you know, if the guide, if the handbook says a specific material is in, let's say we don't have that material here, or it, it's costly to bring that material here, is, does it specify an alternate? Not that I'm aware of. There, there's various types of surface, surface material. You could use sand, pea gravel, wood chips, shredded tires, provided they don't have those, those uh, you know, the radial metal, the metal, yeah, uh, those, or, um, or the more expensive one, which is those rubber matting. And that's not available locally. I see. So, um, if, if we, if, if we um, put an amendment that, that says that this handbook shall only be used as a, as a guideline, then what's the alternative? And so that's what I'm asking, is there, um, you know, there, there's no alternative. I, I don't know what the alternative would, would be with respect to if you, if you purchase a playground material and the manufacturer's specification says this is how it should be installed, this is how it should be used, um, I don't know what implication it would have if we don't follow those guidelines or specifications. But I'm that's for sure. installation, right? I'm talking about the actual equipment. Is, you know, the, the equipment, if, if we're saying this is the, the, the handbook, and, you know, for some reason it's costly, and, and, and which it is, mm -hmm. and which I agree with the providers that it's, a, it's, an, it's an added cost, but I also, I also understand that it's important to think about the safety of our children, right? Um, so I'm trying to look for, you know, where's the alternative? If that type of equipment is, um, you know, difficult to bring in or it's, or it's costly, you know, is there something else that is safe, you know? The public health can say, okay, you know, um, this is an alternative. This equipment here is safer. This is something you can get locally. Mm -hmm. uh, the alternative would be just that 
that there are, the alternatives are either you use rubber material, wood chips, uh, sand, and, and those, there are some materials that actually can be available locally. The only problem when you start using loose fill materials, and it's not something that uh, maybe some, some businesses would like to do because there's a lot more maintenance that is involved when you're using these materials. You have to make sure that, you know, it's free of any insects or, and, it, it, and those that will have some type of spillage, you know, there, there needs to be more, I guess, elbow grease that goes in, into um, using a loose fill material. But, but, but it but is available and it is less costlier than moving towards the unitary material. And that will be the call of the providers. If they, if they decide to start off with something less costly, it will be up to them because then, you know, they would have to maintain it and eventually it would become, you know, more costlier. That's right? correct. So I think that's, I think if, if we could now, Madam Chair, um, like to make that amendment to, if you give me a few, a few seconds and I'll figure out what, how we can do this. We'll take a 10 second recess. Huh?
Senator Rodriguez. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Senator Palacios, this is your amendment. Actually, I have to, uh, yes, I, I put it in writing. It's being, it's going to be passed up so that it, it's in writing. Okay. But this, I think, a, a point of clarification that's raised. Uh, we have not said my amendment yet. Would um, your amendment counter his? All right, let's go back off. Work out with him. We're back on. Uh, do we have a resolution between the two? Senator Palacios. So I was to I withdraw my amendment then because he's going to do an amendment. All right. Thank you very much. But you see, my amendment has been amended. How do we do that? That's OK. We'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, it's just between practical and practicable, so anyway. Yeah, practicable, it's one so word. I moved, I, I, Let, let's take Senator Rodriguez's amendment. Okay, so I'm withdrawing the amendment, though. I moved right, to withdraw my amendment in lieu of uh, Senator Rodriguez's proposed amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to make an amendment on page 43, line 4. After um, the sentence there with special needs, to this new sec, this new, um, you'll start off with the Department of Public Health and Social Services shall review Appendix F and develop guidelines based upon the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission Handbook for Public Playground Safety, which should be applicable for Guam within 120 days of the enactment of this act, period. And then uh, a sub A, it says, the guidelines shall be promulgated pursuant to the AAA rulemaking process. So what, um, Can you provide a work with a copy of it so that we can address this? Okay. We're working on that now. Just, just show it to her and, and see. If
concession. The uh, Rodriguez um, amendment has been circulated. Has everybody had a chance to review it? Uh, anybody wish to be heard on the Rodriguez amendment? Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I support uh, the amendment, but I just want to ask uh, uh, the individuals up there then is that I know that currently you've been working with whatever rules you have, right? And whatever uh, guidelines you have for uh, materials and equipment. Or are you using this uh, handbook? Which one are you using? Do you have your own, or are you using the, uh, the commission handbook? Cur currently? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I can't really speak for, for the licensing, because these are actually currently uh, licensing regulations. Um, I'm from environmental, but LID, what are, what are they doing? No, but from the environmental side then. Oh, what, I'm, what, I'm from, yes. on the environmental side. Yeah, which, um, which ones of the two are you using? Are you using this handbook right now as your guide? Or do you currently have your own? Actually, as referenced in environmental health rules and regs for, for child care facilities, there are certain components in the handbook that we are implementing right now. Um, it's just that our current uh, rules and regulations did not uh, adopt the, the handbook as did the school building. I don't, I don't know the reason for that, but um, it does uh, implement certain criteria like with respect to um, the youth zone and, and our regulations, um, I knew, came into promulgation, it was promulgated in the 80s and at that time the handbook uh, specified that grass was acceptable. So our current regulations Grass is acceptable, so that's the criteria we're using currently. Okay. And, and, and that's important, thank you for sharing that with us, because then that means you really are using some, not yes, all. Yes, that's correct. And they're not really even officially adopted or promulgated at all. So with this amendment then is that now the department will be given 120 days uh, to be able then to you know, develop now your own rules and regs and go through the triple A process. And meanwhile, in between that being done before it actually becomes adopted, then you're going to, you still be able to continue. So it's more subjective really on your part to be able to kind of pick and choose whatever uh, is in that uh, handbook. That, that's, that's correct. And, and, and But the thing is, is that, and is it identified specifically what are, you know, um, being adopted, not officially adopted, but that you're actually referencing to, and that is the same for every single individual who, you know, go out to the uh, daycare centers? Because, and the reason why I ask this question is because we have heard that sometimes when one person comes in, like with licensing, mm -hmm. everything's fine. As soon as the environmental uh, health people come in, they're total in violation, and you know, it's, and it's becoming frustrating for, you know, for these uh, directors. And it's not just even for directors themselves, but sometimes, uh, and I say this not just daycare centers because we're seeing this even in our public schools, that when somebody comes in there, uh, there is totally contradictory from what they've been told, you know, earlier. Just two individuals from the same division in the environmental uh, health office and uh, the principals are just you know, frustrated. And that's why I think that this, and Mr. Chairman, I support of course this, because I think we need to have consistent you know, mm -hmm. standards and that it's, it's not subjective that one person, one inspector would say yes and the other inspector would say no. So I do support this, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Anybody else wish to be heard on the Rodriguez Amendment? Is there an objection to the Rodriguez Amendment? No. Senator Tyron, you have an amendment? All right, thank you. Are there any amendments, any further amendments? Senator Tony Adda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Mr. Chairman, I'd like to go to page 16 on line 15 on staff, staff members, or line 19, I'm sorry. Page 16. Okay, go ahead. I'd like to, on line 19, add the word and in front of teachers, period. Well, I'm sorry. The word teachers and aides, period, and delete cooks and maintenance personnel under staff member. As we have them listed under their own separate categories of cooks and maintenance personnel. Does everybody understand the uh, added amendment? Anybody wish to be heard on that? <clears throat> on the ad amendment to delete cooks and maintenance personnel since they have their own section? <laughs> Senator Yamashita. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair. Uh, to the previous speaker, the reason why I believe it's like that is even though the, the uh, category of cooks and maintenance have their own um, category, is because they do compose the staff. And I think as they go through the rules and regs, they might refer to staff member, and so that um, helps complete a full definition of who a staff member <coughs> is. Uh, thank you. Uh, however, I think if we go to page 46 and we look at the requirements for staff members, I, I, I don't think the, the cooks and maintenance personnel will uh, actually fall under this category of requirements for staff members. Thank you, Senator Greta. I agree. Thank you. All right. So on the Add amendment. Any objection? Uh, Any further amendments? I just have a question for the panel, Mr. Chair. Please. If we go to page 46 of the requirements for staff members, you know, we, I brought up the issue yesterday about the increase in cost, and it was mentioned that usually the, the, um, the outdoor equipment will probably be the highest um, cost contributors, contributor factors to uh, a rise in tuition. However, if you look at the requirements for staff members, it, um, the educational requirements of staff members will be as follows. By 2014, 25% of the early childhood providers employed by the child care facility shall meet the requirements of the level two early childhood lead provider. So by 2014, all staff members must be level two early childhood lead providers. And a minimum requirement for an early childhood lead provider is evidence of completion of 105 to 150 clock hours of training in early childhood educational education from an accredited institution. So I, I, I just wanna go back to the, to the question of is this by 2014, are we, are we going to see a significant increase in tuition costs or child care costs for the island requiring these people to be at a level two uh, early childhood lead provider instead of having them be at a minimum of an assistant, requiring all staff members to be a an assistant instead of a early childhood lead provider level two. On an annual basis, uh, there's many different opportunities in which early childhood providers are given to take uh, professional development training. Um, and so the hours are, can include um, conferences, uh, workshops, um, and this is, and so um, in most instances, lead providers have had either uh, several years, um, uh, have been employed several years within their child, within a child care facility. And so in looking um, and in talking with uh, center directors, when they went back to their center to verify how many of their staff 
would act, are actually at a lead provider, that wasn't an issue. That wasn't a concern. That with the ongoing training that they've been receiving, um, and also uh, if there's documentation that even in-house training uh, within their within their center, if they document in such a way, um, then they can use those hours as well. I understand, but that's not that's not the requirements for the on on the uh, appendix here. The requirements is from an accredited institution. That's the minimum requirements. So if I hire, if 2014 rolls around and I hire someone yesterday, they have to be, they wouldn't be able to be employed because they wouldn't have that, they, they must be a lead to provider by that particular time frame. So, and the minimum requirements is 150 clock hours from an accredited institution. So are we saying now that our child care centers are gonna be accredited institutions to give them that experience or that educational experience? Uh, it also says here for with or 15 hours that have approved in-service training that has them referred to a professional development plan. And so in the professional development plan, um, it provides the opportunity for that provider to work closely with the director in outlining what are some uh, opportunities that they could uh, look at training, whether they participate or not. So this is a, uh, an individualized uh, plan that between the director and the provider, they can determine what kind of professional development courses that, or workshops or training that they would be participating in. But wouldn't, so wouldn't it uh, be more realistic to at least have, by 2014, child, early childhood uh, providers to be at least an assistant provider instead of a lead two, or a, a lead provider level two? Because that's what it's saying here, is that all staff members, by 2014, By 2014, 25% of early childhood providers employed by the, by the child care facility shall meet requirements of a level two early childhood lead provider. Yeah, that, yes, that can happen yeah. as well. I think the notion as we were working with uh, the stakeholders was what, how uh, would be a way of continue to, uh, one of the things that we, we hear from providers is that is there a way to document all the training that they're taking so that it could either go to a career lattice or to a certificate. And so part of the thought with, in working with them was how do they promote the continued quality that's happening in their center. So uh, yes, you could, you could say early childhood is system provider level two. It, it would take it up a notch from the basic requirement uh, for licensing at 15 hours, right? And so that could be done too. So then my, it goes back to my original question. So this would eventually bring the cost significantly up for child, child, uh, I don't think child bring, care. I don't think the, uh, it really would be up to the center. Mm -hmm. There are some centers who would promote quality and would, require, and, would, uh, re, and would reach out to the commission and have their faculty, or their staff uh, go and get certified uh, from the commission and part of that as a business is that they may want to promote their center as saying I have 50% of my staff are mastered early childhood providers and so that's a choice that a, that a business may choose mm -hmm. for the minimum requirement the only thing that we're asking for this uh, for this uh, regulation is that they have 15 hours of training now, the option, that's path A. For the option for path B is open to both pi, uh, public and private. Because this early childhood professional uh, plan includes Head Start, includes preschool special education, includes early intervention, right? And so it really would be at the discretion of the center if they choose to, to, uh, to encourage their staff to improve their 
early childhood skills and provide on ongoing in service training. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dratic. Any other further amendments? Well, you better tell your boss to or something. Any other amendments? Any other amendments? Go ahead, Madam Seeger. Uh, this is a question that may be overall, because I know that um, there are a lot of concerns here about setting up the rules and regs <clears throat> for this. Earlier, we had put aside now requesting for separate rules and regs for the equipment. I'm wondering now with, uh, because this is another appendix. This, there are so many appendices here. A to F, I think, is what we have, and then whether each one of these appendices have been addressed separately, not just the whole picture when you went out, but each one of them looked at separately, and whether rules and regs for each one of these should have been done separately. How was this uh, you know, handled? For example, the appendices that refer to Guam's early learning guidelines um, we are referencing that as a, a volunteer guidelines for providers to use. And the reason why it's noted in the state plan, I mean in the regulation, is that um, we don't want providers or uh, centers to guess what children should know and be able to do. We know through the research uh, developmental milestones and so this is what we expect children to do. This is what you could do as a provider. This is how it aligns to uh, the Head Start performance standards and, and for how it aligns to DOE's performance standards. So the early learning guidelines, it's there, it's a tool, and it's a mechanism for us to uh, look and give us guidelines of what kids should be able to do. It's volunteer, and so I think we've invested so much time and energy on having our guidelines be something that is from Guam and had received technical assistance in developing it from the National Infant and Toddler Initiative. So Guam was one of the 12 states across the country to come up with their early learning guidelines for infants and toddlers. I think putting it in there as a guidance, as a volunteer, as an attachment, is I think it's a good thing because we don't want people to guess. We know. And, and for that appendix, it is volunteer. And so uh, I don't know if you need it. Wait, no, I, I don't understand. You're saying this now is a guideline? No, the appendix a number a? B. Oh, B. Oh, I thought you were saying A because I'm looking no, at appendix A. appendix B. For ex I was giving you an example because you oh, said okay, but appendix. Okay, but appendix A already has gone through uh, the triple A. Has, has, has appendix A gone through the triple A? No? It's, it's not considered, um, reg well, it's, it's not considered regulations. It's part of what we want to include in terms of personnel, but, um, but, staffing development in our licensing say, rules. How can you say no when uh, the Guam Certification Council actually went through the AAA for all of their certification? And now not, how can you say that this, it's not, the AAA is not applicable uh, to, to Appendix A. How we've been working on Appendix A in collaboration with the Guam Commission is that um, this provides them as a guiding, guidance of when a, an individual comes in, for example, a Head Start teacher comes in and is going to request for a certification, right? And so this document is a, it's, it provides for, because at this point, I mean, for, for DOE, there isn't any specific uh, guidance for how are they going to certify a early interventionist or a uh, preschool special education teacher. It, and so this actually assists them in looking at what are the requirements. Um, and so they've looked at that and, and how they, uh, the commission, my understanding the commission 
uh, will do is review it and then whether adopted as part of their process as certification. So, uh, does that answer your question? Are there any other amendments? Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the earlier amendment that we passed that took off the definitions of, uh, or took out cooks and maintenance under staff members, um, causes us now to have to amend um, section, or page 44, line 14, on the information of current staff members, and it says the following information shall be supplied to the division for all staff members. And so we took out the cooks and maintenance as a staff member, then we would have to now add our staff members inclusive of cooks and maintenance, just to make sure that um, they don't fall through the crack. Does everybody understand that amendment? That on line 14, it'll read information on current staff members inclusive of cooks and maintenance personnel. Okay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any objection to the amendment? Anybody wish to be heard? We'll take a short recess until the speaker comes back with her.
Stan, do you have an amendment? <coughs> yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the amendment I, I want to, to uh, offer is that uh, on, oh, I'm trying to find where, which section are we going to put it in the page, but I guess we're going to ask legal counsel to determine where it would be best to, to place it. But the Department of Public Health and Social Services shall review Appendix A, page 8, positions 1, 2, and 3 for early childhood lead providers to develop and develop rules and regulations within 120 days of the enactment of this act and that the rules and regulations should be promulgated pursuant to AAA <coughs> making procedures. Okay, does everybody understand that amendment? Does anybody require it in writing? No, all right, then is there any objection to the amendment? No. Any other amendments? Senators? Any other amendments? Senator Tony Adda. Uh, yes, thank you. thank you, Mr. Chair. Just on page 47, you know, we went back to that um, level two early childhood lead provider. I think that I'd like to amend that from level two early childhood lead provider uh, to cross out lead and put assistant. So it'll read level two early childhood assistant provider. Line three on page 47. Does everybody understand the amendment? Is there an objection? Question. Uh, Page 47, line three, delete lead and put in assistant. Okay, I have a question on that. Uh, primarily because on page eight of the appendix, that the, there are three. There's an early childhood assistant provider levels one to four then an early childhood lead provider levels one to four, and then you have the childhood master provider and assistant director. So maybe can you explain to, to us then that if this change then is made from a lead to an assistant, then that means you won't have any longer than a lead provider for levels one to four? What, or is that synonymous with uh, each other, the uh, lead and assistant? There, that I don't think they are. That's why I'm asking you to please explain so that then whether it would be appropriate, you know, for us to, to make that change uh, because or whether this is a different, an, a, a different elevated you know, yes. positions you can yes. work a progression of, uh, of you know, um, the more experience you have, the more credits you have, the yes. more that eventually go from an assistant to a lead right. provider. Yeah. Yes. So just keep it. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. I, yeah, I would keep it. Right. Because it's a career. We're looking at a career lattice. Right. Please. Thank you very much. I certainly understand the concern, I think, that is needing uh, the uh, author of the amendment to present this. But given the, the requirements, really, for the assistant provider, um, that I would say almost everybody in the system already is at that level. And so by putting the requirement that they get to that level by 2014, we really aren't upgrading, we won't be upgrading the staff capacity level by you know, reducing this. And so this would give that elevation <coughs> by 2014. Um, so I would think that for me, I would prefer uh, to keep that lead and give that career path uh, an additional uh, uh, increase in the, the capacity level of these providers uh, by 2014. I don't think it will be too hard to reach it by 2014 uh, because if you put the assistant there, I think everybody's at that level now and there's no need to wait until 2014 uh, because everybody has received, just about everybody has received at least 15 hours of training uh, for the to qualify as an assistant provider, so um, I, I think it would be uh, for me better to leave it at that lead uh, and would oppose the reduction. All right. There's there's opposition. There's an objection to the amendment. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, 
I'll just go ahead and withdraw the amendment. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, and that way we would just keep it on the same level then. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Any other amendments? If not, Mr. Chairman, you're recognized. I, it was giving birth to, a, to an elephant. It was 16 month gestation. I'm hoping All right, uh, do you have another amendment, Senator Tony Atta? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I, I was just, um, just a little uh, a concern here on, the, uh, on page 56, line 15 refraining from releasing children to family. And it says, if a, per if a parent or authorized person is found to be behaving in a way that impairs the person's ability to care for the child, drunken behavior, belligerent, or lack of suitable equipment, then the child care provider shall contact law, you know, will, shall refrain from releasing the child to the family, and child care provider shall contact law, appropriate law enforcement agents as needed. I'm just, I'm, I know the safety of the child is the first and foremost, but what kind of liability does this put on to the child care centers if they don't release, especially to a drunken, belligerent individual? Uh, what kind of danger or what kind of, um, what, what can actually, I mean, how do we, how do we address this? Um, well, for one thing, this section um, is um, something that the uh, providers um, actually are, have approved or concur with because uh, they have had certain circumstances where these events have occurred. Um, so it kind of gives them the parameters to um, do what they need to do. And if it means uh, refraining from um, releasing that child to um, prevent any danger, further danger, or what have you, they'll, they, they know that they will likely have to contact the appropriate authorities and I guess the next uh, of kin in line or, or what have you. But I know that this is a, a section that um, uh, the providers have expressed um, concurrence over. I'm just concerned because, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're all concerned about the life of every child. However, when you're dealing with a belligerent or a drunk individual, uh, the, the safety of the staff and other children can also come into play. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, I'm, I'm really surprised that the child care centers would take this liability upon themselves that they would hold, um, that they will hold back on it. I, I, th that's why I just don't know what's the proper way to address this or how we can come up with the solution that would be both safe to the, the, the child that's being released and to the staff and children that are still there too. Senator Yamashita. Um, to the previous speaker and connecting with what Ms. Tenorio has, has stated, uh, when uh, families um, find a place to, uh, that they want their child to be in, uh, there's typically a registration process or a, um, orientation and they're all, every center has their roles and uh, they reviewed that uh, they will release their, the child only to certain people and that of only uh, with certain conditions. And they are aware that if somebody shows up who is drunk or on drugs or uh, uh, the behavior is off, that that child will not go to that family. So I think that's, there's an understanding. This happens, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And so the laws are already in place where, um, you know, we. Uh, we, as Lydia said, we try to contact the next on the list. Uh, we can't find that person, then um, uh, we do call uh, the police. And we have the police come in and do their job. 
and that is to protect uh, the family. And it's, and it's quick, and it's done. And so um, if that person is belligerent on the, uh, on the facility, then the phone call to the police are made quickly. And we're not, we close the doors, and we're, you know, we don't allow them to enter and to um, um, hurt anybody. And, and that's why the training is so critical for everybody who is on the staff. And it's so critical for all the staff providers to know what to do and how to do it because uh, the safety issue is paramount. And there is great liability. And that's why everything that happens here uh, from the beginning is so significant and critical. So I appreciate all the statements you're making about the safety of uh, not only that child, but all the staff members and the other children who um, are in that facility at that time. But the, that situation is addressed and everybody's prepared to move uh, accordingly, and the police are very good at working with us, and so is CPS. CPS moves in as needed, and the, the children are taken care of um, in, uh, in accord with the current rules and regulations. Thank you, Senator Yamashita. Senator Adam, do you have? That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Madam Speaker. I just want to um, clarify one thing. Uh, the basic uh, preschool teachers is that they go through the Commission for Educator Certification. I want to know is that for the early childhood uh, lead providers and the assistant providers, then who would determine then the certification <coughs> of, of these individuals? Uh, yes. Um, in the, propo in the uh, uh, professional development plan uh, for private child care providers, there is two paths. Um, they can choose path A, which uh, would require them to get 15 hours of credit, and there's a subcommittee that is uh, that will review that, uh, their, their uh, application, and uh, acknowledge whether they've met the certification for licensing. And that document will be part of the application process that is given to um, uh, this part of the Child care's application for licensing. Now, if a pro if a provider chooses to get a certification from the commission, that that's a choice that they can do, and so they would submit their documentation, and they would get a certificate saying that they're a lead provider or a master provider, right? And so it would be okay. It's a, okay. that noise is from any uh, live uh, cell phones next to the microphones. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so okay. So uh, so just for for the uh, the lead providers and the assistant providers, it will be part and of the, the licensing that when yes. they go to public health, then and they'll make sure then that they, they do qualify. Yes, yeah, they would submit an application. There's a subcommittee okay. that reviews it with representation from both university, GCC, um, as well as the Guam Caregivers Association. Okay. Thank you very much. Senator Pangolinan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker and uh, Mr. Chair, um, I have one concern in, in, um, on page 23, and I think that uh, it just triggered uh, my, my memory here when the uh, good senator from uh, Afamisi Nahanya had talked about releasing the child. Uh, on page 23, line 25, uh, number 7, uh, one of the testimony given by one of the providers was the fact that you know they have the doctor of the child, they have three individuals to call if the child should be sick, and then this requirement that they also get a written consent to call another physician uh, when deemed necessary. And they, um, they had said that you know if the child's sick, we call the parents, we call the doctor, we still can't get, maybe we should just call 911 instead of now having this extra step of having to call another doctor. So uh, the motion I would make then, based upon the feedback during the public hearing, uh, would be just to delete number seven. Uh, and that they have the three individuals, they have the parents, they have a doctor, and if you can't get any of those individuals to respond, then just call 911 and, and make sure that the child gets the care rather than having to now call another physician who may not be available again and so forth. So it would be to just to delete number seven. On the Pangolinan Amendment to delete seven on page 23, Senator Yamashita. I fully support that amendment. I was at the public hearing, and the, and the whole idea behind that to support um, Speaker Ben is that 
the, the care providers um, are, should not be in the business of finding the doctor to take care of the child, but the family needs to come and take care of that child. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to be heard on Senator Pangolin, Madam Speaker? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I agree that we shouldn't have to call for another uh, physician, but I'm just wondering too that if we take that out and not put it in by saying that, you know, that's the ultimate thing, is that you try your very best to get in touch with the parent, the physician, know that, now call 911 or call for an ambulance, whatever it is. And rather than just delete number seven, I would rather put that down, is that the next recourse now is um, call for, you know, the uh, emergency 911, rather than just delete it entirely. But the section is what information is supposed to be provided. Well, I, I realize that's true. But at the same time, though, because they should, I mean, it should even be in the cards. I know the registration cards that uh, we always ask them, who and we, who do we call and all that. And then the next step is ultimately, because sometimes there are people that are looking at this and they're saying, well, I can't get a hold of anybody else. What do I do now? You know, I'm sorry, but it, it does happen. So should, is your proposal that the amendment read Written consent to call 911 when deemed necessary, and we drop another physician? On the Pangolinan Amendment, is that an objection, Madam Speaker, or are you amending and amending? All right. So on the Pangolinan Amendment, is there an objection? No. Any other amendments before I recognize the Chairman to Is it major Mr. Majority Leader? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, after uh, exhausting uh, all the concerns that the members of the legislature uh, had uh, relative to Bill Number 70-31, I'm privileged to uh, make the motion that we arise from the Committee of the Whole uh, on the matter of Bill 70-31 as substituted by the Committee on Health and Human Services, Economic Development, Senior Citizens, and Election Reform. And I join our uh, oversight uh, health care chairman in thanking the uh, uh, distinguished panel from the Department of Public Health and Social Services for uh, all the time you've spent uh, to indulge us and to uh, entertain uh, all the concerns that we have uh, to uh, improve upon uh, this bill so we can have these uh, rules and regulations uh, in place. And so. Uh, every member of this legislature uh, thanks you for your, your patience. And we also recognize and thank the Committee on Health for its due diligence, uh, Mr. Chairman. So having said that, um, I, mo I move that we rise and with all the uh, amendments made while in the Committee of the Whole uh, be intact. With a recommendation to pass. I, the Chair wishes to be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank um, um, my colleagues for you know, the opportunity to getting us this, this far. And we're one step closer. I want to thank the panel uh, for your hard work also. You guys have been working on this. Um, Senator Yamashita as well has been working on this for many, many years. And so I know that it's um, come before the legislature in the past. Um, and so um, with everybody's assistance here, uh, the whole body, in, in allowing for this committee of the whole and, and allowing for us to get this far, we're, we're almost there. So once um, and if it's passed by this uh, legislature, then we can consider this one of the landmark legislation of this body. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the motion of the majority leader to rise. With Sua Sponte, we are recessed until 9 tomorrow morning. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.